All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening. The Durham Public Schools monthly meeting is now in session. At this time, we wish to extend a warm welcome to everyone who is joining us this evening. The purpose of this meeting is to inform our parents, staff, and constituents about the work aligned with our mission to embrace, educate, and empower every student to innovate, to serve, and to lead. The interpreters for tonight are Martha Romo Iguiles and Ra Marty Ramirez. Thank you all for taking the time to join us. The second item on our agenda is the moment of silence. We'll take that at this time. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is celebrations. I'll pass it to Mr. Sutter. Thank you, Madam Chair. There we go. Celebrations. It's the best day of the week. Uh, and we have a lot of students here for us tonight uh, to be recognized. There are some times when uh, the Office of Public Affairs seems to require air traffic controller capabilities, and this is no exception. So the order today is going to include our Battle of the Books winners, our Superintendent's Student Advisory Council, our Students of the Month, and our Spark recipients. We have a lot of Battle of the Books recipients here today. And what we're going to do, uh, this is a message for the folks outside, is uh, our L our students uh, from Battle of the Books will come down this aisle. Uh, our parents, if they want to come into the room, uh, can go against the far wall, and we will take group pictures at the end of the recognitions, and then we'll move on to the student uh, the student advisory council. So, with our Battle of the Books recipients, I turn it over to Heidi Perez. Thank you, Chip. Good evening, board members, Superintendent Mubenga, staff and community members. I wanna thank you for sharing this time and space with us. You know, reading can spark creativity and passion in all DPS learners. And so tonight we have some sparks with us. The North Carolina Battle of the Books is a reading engagement program of the North Carolina School Library Media Association. Students at participating schools, read books from a list established by the State Battle of the Books Committee, and then compete in quiz bowl style tournaments to test their knowledge of these books. Here in Durham Public Schools, we empower all schools to participate in this literacy enrichment opportunity by providing fees, books, transportation, and district coordination support for all elementary, middle, and high schools that choose to participate Tonight, we celebrate our DPS uh, District Battle of the Books winners who will participate in regional and state competitions over the next few weeks. So our first uh, champion team is Easley Elementary School. They place first in our district competition and they will compete in the Region 3 competition on April 29th, correct? Um, our coaches are Caroline Hartley and Tracy Keeler. Uh, student participants are Olivia Borges, Col Coltrane Cox, Kaylee Edwards, Sam Ilu, Gavin Farber, Lindsay Gardner, Cooper Hansarek, Malin Merwin, Chase Reynolds, Brennan Sewell, Sylvia Smith, Hannah Upchurch, Naomi Gunzel, and Rosie Sweet. <laughs> Our middle school district champions are Lakewood Montessori Middle School. They will compete in the Region 3 competition right here in Durham at the Mini Fort Brown Staff Development Center this Saturday. Our coaches, uh, our coach is Kara Watson, and the student uh, competitors are Nola Eisner, Lila Goldstein, Jane Gray, Isabel Halpern, Isabella Hasi, Lucy Heary, Thea Milley, Eliza Porter, Kira Prem Premkumar, Mira Riffer, Cole Cease, Lena Tonkin, Maggie Phillips, and Lily Rentar.
our high school champions are Durham School of the Arts. They actually won the Region 3 competition yesterday. So they will compete. They will compete in the State High School Battle of the Books competition right here in Durham at the Mini Fort Brown Staff Development Center on April 29th. The coaches are Kim Gugino, Hannah Murky. The student competitors are Emma Bush, Will Coward, Maxwell Gua, Elizabeth Cramling, Eloise Litzow, Ian Moran, Layla Nyblock, Avanel O'Keefe, Caitlin Ryan, Roland Sapigau, and Keb Sills. Thank you. Can we have our elementary students up front for the group for the group picture? Right. Do we have space for our board members as well, Tony? Can we, or they can stand up the day. I see either way, Tony. Yeah, two rows of Board members come into the building. Congratulations to our elementary winners. Yep. Our elementary students and their families can, can exit and we'll make room for our middle school students and their families. And finally, our high school winners. Got 
ladies and gentlemen, we have one more group photo experience ahead of us. We also have a number of important students who help provide uh, Dr. Mabinga with guidance as he works on behalf of our board and community to provide uh, strong schools. And that is the super superintendent's student advisory council. Here to present them is Deputy Superintendent, Dr. Nakia Hardy. Thank you, Mr. Sutter. Amazing, talented, innovative, dynamic, change agents, pioneers. These are just a few of the words that come to mind when I think about the students that serve this year on the Superintendent Student Advisory Council. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce these amazing young people to our board and to recognize them for their dedication and service this year. These members met quarterly with Dr. Mabinga to provide valuable input on issues facing our students and our community. They served as advisors to the superintendent and administration on a wide range of topics, challenges, and issues. Some of them, including providing input to our strategic plan, which is on our agenda this evening learning about federal nutrition guidelines for school nutrition services, an overview as well as input on the 18 million McKinsey Scott grant donation, the board approved funding, which includes this request that high school clubs receive funding for activities to provide service to their school and the broader community. Input on growing together in our secondary programs, a discussion and sharing specific information and they provided us guidance on how we can support our school communities regarding mental health, stress management, coping mechanisms, vaping, as well as additional supports that our children need. Our students were honest, forthright, and very clear in what could be done to make DPS the best that it can be for each and every student. We are grateful to each member of the council which represented each of our high schools in the district. We wanna thank our high school principals, some of which are out in the hall for sending and recommending such outstanding young people to represent their schools. We wanna thank their parents, their families and caregivers for sharing their most precious gift with us here in Durham Public Schools and for raising such talented, outstanding students. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce the members of the Superintendent's Advisory Council. I do wanna note all of them could not be with us today because they are doing what they do best. They are serving in our community. They are giving back to DPS. So unfortunately, all of them cannot be here. I also wanna share that they received, each of them did receive their t-shirt. They're wearing them tonight. They look so good for their picture. As a response to an appreciation of their service, we want them to have that as a memento as they move forward. All right, are we ready? Dahlia Cooling from City of Medicine. From Durham School of Technology, Charles King, Joshuana Corvey, and Erica Ziegler. From Hillside High School, Alicia Davis and Justin Sims. From Jordan High School, Grady Dupree Isaac and Caroline Sangvi. From Middle College High School, Hannah Hummel. From Southern High School, on Win, and from School for Creative Studies, Abigail Hedgepath. And I would also like to thank Dr. Deborah Pittman, our Assistant Superintendent for Specialized Services, and her office for coordinating our events as well.
It's my understanding and belief that at least one of the students that you just saw, you're about to see again. We are now wonder. We are now up to the wonderful monthly student of the month presentation, where we introduce to you students who distinguish themselves in scholarship, leadership, and service and perseverance. We have two rep representing uh, two uh, recipients tonight. And our first comes from Hillside High School. And I call on uh, Dr. Logan. Great evening. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be here uh, this evening to introduce a stellar student here at Hillside High School. Uh, there are so many things that I can say about this young lady. I, this is the first time I've had to bring a resume, uh, just based on a lot of the things that she's been able to accomplish. Uh, Alicia Davis is a senior at Hillside High School who is currently in our International Baccalaureate program. Alicia has Currently, uh, she currently has a 4.6 grade point average on a five point scale. She's ranked number three in her class currently. Uh, since her ninth grade year, uh, she has earned all A's in all of her classes. And I imagine that will be the case when she gets to graduation on June 12th. So we're really pleased about her work in that area. And uh, again, Having all A's, these are the A's that pay, uh, is how I like to describe it, because uh, her work ethic is such that uh, she has earned for herself opportunities um, uh, that abound at the collegiate level. I think she was adamant when I asked her uh, about her ambitions after high school. She was adamant that she wasn't going to go to UNC at Chapel Hill because that's where her mother went. <laughs> and uh, Ms. Davis is over here as well as Mr. Davis, uh, her grandfather. Uh, Alicia uh, has the option. She's created options for herself in such a way where she has a full ride to Harvard University, Duke University. And so she's undecided about what she wants to do. Uh, in terms of which school she wants to go to. She has been a member of the uh, Chick Tech uh, organization where she received the Chick Tech Gold Participation Award for completing 50 hours of STEM uh, service with that organization. She has participated in the Duke University Pre-College Graphic Design and Visual Appeal Award. That's the award that she earned for most thought-provoking digital medium. Uh, she's a member of Mu Alpha Theta Math Honor Society. She's also a member of the National Honor Society, the Science National Honor Society, the W.E.B. Du Bois National Honor Society, just to list a few. Uh, she is the embodiment of our school's core values of responsibility, work ethic, teamwork, and respect. Um, she has been consistently herself since I've known her, and this is largely because I've had the pleasure of knowing her before she was even born. Uh, her mom was a senior at Hillside High School when I became an assistant principal here in Durham Public Schools, and she was one of the persons that graciously embraced me when I came to Durham Public Schools. So, Ms. Davis, I appreciate that, and thank you for making my job all the easier. And so, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, again, Ms. Alicia Davis. And um, thank you all so much for this honor. Um, I just want to thank my mom and my grandfather and my grandmother because it wouldn't be possible without my family and the Hillside community and Dr. Logan and superintendent because you've been so supportive throughout the year. And I really appreciate everybody that acknowledged me for this honor. Thank you so much. Don't go too far. So I have to hand you things. Okay. <laughs> So this is a certificate that you will hold next to the superintendent. He will shake your hand. You will both smile beautifully. He will take a picture. It'll be lovely. And then we have some more things for you. This is a spark pen, which we provide to all of our students of the month and all of the individuals associated with Durham Public Schools who distinguish themselves as leaders. That is you. I hope that you will wear this with pride. And uh, when you go to Harvard, or if you have to, Duke, um, 
sorry, I'm a bitter UNC alumnus. Um, if they ask what this pin is all about, I hope you tell them, and I hope you show how proud you are of uh, Durham and where you came from. And from the Raven Family Foundation, we also have a certificate of appreciation and a $250 scholarship gift. And we have also from our friends at Triangle eCycling, a laptop computer for you. We're proud of you. Thank you for being our student of the month. So I'm going to put this all in the class. And we have one more student of the month tonight. And for that, for CE Jordan High School, I turn things over to Susan Taylor. Good evening. On behalf of Jordan High School, I present Ava Kinghorn, JHS Class of 2024, as our DPS Student of the Month. Ava, as shared by her nominator, represents the academic excellence Jordan is known for. She maintains a rigorous course schedule, earns high grades, takes multiple advanced placement courses, and exceeds faculty expectations with all of her work. Ava is on the path to graduate with the AP Capstone Diploma. She participates in multiple honor societies and is at the top of her graduating class. In addition to spending time volunteering for our school and outside organizations, Ava is active in a variety of clubs and demonstrates leadership on the track and cross country team. Ava consistently soars due, due to her work ethic, growth mindset, and natural curiosity. Mr. McDonald, social studies teacher and advanced placement chair states that Ava wants to know the why when it comes to content. She listens to understand and seeks additional information because she wants a deeper understanding. Ava, thank you for choosing Jordan and congratulations on being our DPS Student of the Month. Thank you so much for this honor. I'm deeply appreciative. Again, uh, stop me if you've heard this before, but we have a certificate for you. We also have a laptop computer for you from Triangle eCycling, a scholarship gift from the Raven Family Foundation, and a spark pin for you that we hope that you will wear with pride in honor of Durham, Durham County, Durham Public Schools, and Jordan High School. Thank you so much, Ava. Congratulations.
We have one more um, Spark, Spark recipient tonight, and this is a very special one. Um, that Spark recipient uh, was actually surprised with the full, uh, with her full award at, South East, at Southwest Elementary School uh, several days ago, but we wanted to present her here at the board meeting tonight. And that is DPS's Assistant Principal of the Year, Tori Flores. She has been at Southwest Elementary School for 12 years. She was a reading recovery teacher. She came here to a central office position as a K-5 literacy specialist, but missed the children and has been an important, vital part of Southwest Elementary since then. She makes her students and their families feel seen and is always placing relationships at the heart of everything she does. She says, if I want a child to love to read, I can't just tell them to do that. I have to build that relationship with them. I have to find what interests them, and I have to find as many things that they're doing right as the one thing I need them to do a little bit differently or a little bit better the next time. She hopes that when students and staff leave Southwest that they are better for having had the experience and can choose joy and keep a positive mindset in any endeavor of their lives to stay afloat. We depend on our assistant principals far more than anybody knows. It is the principal who is the, the CEO of the school and the public face. It is the assistant principal or principals who take that, uh, who take that ex their experience, their relationships with the students, with the staff, and help empower the principal to do their best work. They're leaders in their own right. And Tori Flores, this year is our best of the best. Thank you for everything you do for the students at Southwest and for being here tonight. This is your spark pen. Please wear it with pride. And if you'd like to say a few words before the photo, we'd love it. I am just honored to be recognized. Um, it's not why I do this job. You know, I come to school every day for my families and for my students and to be recognized in this way is just an honor and I appreciate that more than you know. Durham has been a big part of my life. I've been working for Durham Public Schools for 23 years in a variety of different ways. Um, I've chosen Durham for many reasons. I even chose to bring my son with me to Southwest Elementary School and I would make those choices again. So it has been a special part of my life, and I am honored to be a part of Durham Public Schools. Thank you for this recognition. Madam Chair, members of the board, that concludes celebrations for the night. Thank you, Mr. Sutterith, and to all the folks who participated in our celebrations. It was such a great opportunity to have our boardroom filled with all the great things we love about our public schools. So thank you all. The next item on our agenda is the superintendent's update. I'm going to pass it to Dr. Mapinga. Madam Chair, board members, it's good to be here this evening, less than a week after one of our most successful job fairs in DPS history. We had prospective teachers and staff arriving at Hillside High School right up until the end of the job fair. And I want to emphasize the words and staff. This was our most successful effort to include operational and administrative job opportunities as well as teaching opportunities. I am proud of Human Resources Department for putting on such a great recruitment event 
but also for the massive outreach this year in going to universities around the country and also recruiting outside the country to leave no stone unturned. We keep repeating that this is a statewide and national hiring crisis for teachers and staff, but we have to compete for every outstanding candidate as well as retaining the outstanding teachers and employees that we have in DPS. That is then to district leadership as well. Since I arrived in Durham Public Schools, I've been pleased with the continuity with I've had for years in my cabinet and senior leadership. That being said, two of my cabinets are moving on to new challenges. Dr. Monk and Mr. Sardis. I would have more to say about both of them at a future meeting. They are still with us and fulfilling their responsibilities. But I did want to let you know that their positions are posted and we are conducting a thorough, thorough search for the successors. Unexpected cha changes bring an opportunity for plan change and we are in a continuous improvement business. In Durham Public Schools, we build on past success for great success. Tomorrow, our board and cabinet will take part in the afternoon of training regarding our LGBTQIA community. I want to thank the board for taking up this responsibility to ensure that we are serving all our students and staff equitably and respectfully. These are difficult times for the LGBTQIA community, and we have to address its concerns because it's not a separate community. It is our community. We are one Durham Public Schools. Board members, I look forward to seeing you at the mini center tomorrow. Finally, I want to note that we are nearing to the end of this academic year. We are looking for a strong finish. We, we gained a lot of grants last year after the academic and social emotional losses that came with the pandemic lockdown, but our students and families are looking for even more growth and progress, and so am I. As we are heading into a time of intense remediation and acceleration, preparation for assessment and preparation for graduation, please know that our schools are going to be even more focused on the reason Durham Public School exists, academic excellence that enable our students to succeed in life. So I ask for our community support for our students and schools as our teachers and principals make the main thing the main thing. Thank you, Madam Chair. That concludes my remarks. Thank you, Dr. Mabinga. The next item on our agenda is agenda review and approval. Move approval of the agenda as presented. Second. It's been moved by Ms. Byers, seconded by Ms. Chavez. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, please use the same sign. It passes unanimously. The next item on our agenda is the Board of Education monthly meeting minutes from March 23rd, 2023. Move approval of the minutes. Second. It's been moved by Ms. Rogers, seconded by Ms. Byer. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, please use the same sign. Passes unanimously. The next item on our agenda is general public comments. Before we get started, I'll do a quick review of the rules. Please state your name. And if you are speaking for an organization, please state your name and the name of the organization you are speaking for. Second, speakers are asked to present their comments in a specified time. We have about 20 something speakers signed up tonight. So we're gonna ask you to do two minutes. When the yellow light comes on, you'll have one minute left to wind up your remarks. When the red light comes on, it will beep, which indicates your time is up. Complaints about named staff, st uh, students, or parents should not be voiced in open session. However, we are very interested in hearing your concerns with regard to public education, safety of students, and the operations of the school system. Finally, board members will listen carefully and will consider your comments, but we do not engage in a discussion with our speakers. 
Our first speaker will be Wanda Boone, Dr. Wanda Boone, followed by Kayla Scales McKay. Good evening and thank you so much. I'm Dr. Wanda Boone. My organization is Together for Resilient Youth. I'm a member of DPS SHAC, Health and Safety Committee, uh, Board of Education uh, member, appointee, I should say. I am chair of the Health and Safety Committee for the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People. And I'm also the chair of the North Carolina State Health Improvement um, Project, um, ACES and Resilience. So holding young people solely responsible for, and you can fill in the blank, is like holding fish responsible for dying in a polluted stream. Every child needs at least one adult that is irrationally crazy about him or her. Um, the issue of violence and gun violence is a problem for our whole community. This is a multiple level challenge that will take our individual strengths to find solutions. If it's in the streets, if it's in the schools, if it's in the community of faith, if it's in law enforcement, if it's in local government, if it's in community-based organizations, if it's at home as a parent, foster parent, or as a resident, we should support each other and join our unique gifts together to form a safety net for our treasure, our youth. So I commit, together for resilient youth, to be a partner in all efforts to stem the violence. Ubuntu, let's go forward and do this together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boone. Kayla Scales McCoy, I'm sorry, Kayla. And Kenya Myers will be next. Good evening, board. My name is Kayla Scales McCoy and I am a student at Durham School of the Arts. As a student who has been affected by gun violence, I would like to speak on the proposal for a day of remembrance. We have lost the lives of many teens in Durham and their memory deserves to be honored. I commend DPS and the city and county of Durham for proposing the idea of a day of remembrance. However, everyone grieves differently and doing a district-wide announcement saying the names of the lives that were lost in a moment of silence could be triggering for students. I watched the previous work session and saw how one board member got offended by what another board member said. Now put yourself in our shoes. If a student laughs or says a rude comment during the moment of silence, someone who is affected by gun violence might speak up like the board member did, creating more violence. Another issue is when grief counselors come to the schools, they are only there for a week. Nobody can process their grief in five days. I was traumatized by gun violence at the age of six. I am 15 and still struggle with processing my grief and trauma. Wanting to make a change is an amazing idea, like with the memorial at the Bull because it is optional but requiring students to do a moment of silence across all schools is opening up an opportunity for more violence. The bottom line is DPS does not have sufficient funding or resources to manage the potential increase in trauma and mental health issues this day of remembrance could cause. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Kenya Myers, and I apologize anyone if I mispronounce your names, followed by Linda Kersey. Um, good evening, school board members. My name is Kenya Myers. I'm a Durham County resident and proud mother of two daughters. My oldest matriculated through Durham Public Schools, attending Pearson Town, Rogers Hur, and graduated from J.D. Clement Early College in 2012 with 47 college credits. My baby girl is why I'm here this evening. She is currently a 10th grader at Durham School of Technology. She will end this school year hopefully with an A average and 15 college credits. Board, I felt the need to remind you tonight two things, that parents have options and to ask you to move Durham School of Technology to our own independent space. When my 10th grader began her schooling, we were concerned about curriculum rigor at our assigned base elementary Durham Public School. So we made the decision to pay tuition and have her attend a private school for grades K through five. We had the same concerns for grades six through eight and so we again sent her to private school. When it was time to search for high schools, I was told by the Office of School Assignment in 2020 that the, new, that the then New Tech High School would have a name change and be relocated out of its current space. So it was added to my list. Um, I can assure you that had she not 
uh, received a lot of receipts, she would not be enrolled in Durham Public Schools. Because I, as, as a parent, I have options. All DPS parents have options. And there's actually proposed legislation to give more parents um, options by giving vouchers to parents now without any income restrictions. Think about that. More parents are going to be able to access private schools. Our school name has been changed, but I need for you board to do what you said that you would do, which is move our school to our own independent location expeditiously, please, before the next school year begins. To not move us would deny our students the equity the school system promises. Right now, Durham School of Technology is the only specialty school without our own space. CMA has their own space, early college, middle, middle college, and reside on campus have their own independent building. Um, I do want to say lastly, and I, re I realize I'm over time, but our students actually during the, um, the spring break last week, um, our students were not able to access the library for an entire week because the librarians, rightly so, were on vacation. But our students were in school. So I would just like to ask you, and please move us, do not use budget limitations. Um, provide our students with the same equity and resources that all the specialty Thank school students have. I'm Thank sorry you. to cut you off. Thank you, Ms. Myers. If you do have additional comments and you want to share them with the board because the time is shorter tonight, you can email the board or if you have a written copy, you can leave it here with our board assistant who's raising her hand in the back and we'll make sure that gets to everyone. The board's email address is boe at dpsnc.net. Go ahead on. All right, we'll make sure we read it because we know that we the time is a little shorter tonight. All right, next is Lydia Kirk Kirksey. And again, I please correct me on your names, you all. And uh, a Wilson, Kaya Wilson. All right, I know we have, I think there's some additional students in the hallway. We got a couple of seats that have opened up. Um, in the boardroom if you all want to come in. Good evening. Given the topic that the next few presenters will be discussing today, we thought it would be right to warn that there will be mentions of sexual assault, unhealthy relationships, and other topics associated with gender-based violence. I'm student A. I'm 16 years old, a junior at Jordan High School, and I would like to talk about the prolonged process of making a sexual assault report with DPS Title IX. Six girls, including myself on the Jordan cross country team were sexually assaulted by our male teammate multiple times over 210 days ago. Cross country practice started in August, 2022. This was the first time we met the perpetrator. Through the month of September, the perpetrator touched our asses during drills and played it off as an accidental touch when walking by us in line. This was happening multiple times a day to multiple girls. September 22nd, 2022 was the day we realized we had all been violated sexually by the perpetrator, day zero. The next day, we reported to our coaches who took immediate action in telling the principal, and that day a Title IX administrator had us record our written statements. She told us it would take six weeks to find an investigator, day one. Day 66, November 28, 2022, witnesses and complainants received letters requesting an interview conducted by the equity coordinator. Cross country season had ended at this point. Day 77, December 9th, 2022, exactly 11 weeks after the day we reported, interviews were held. We were told that we would be updated throughout the process. Winter track had already begun. All complainants, as well as the perpetrator, participated in winter track. Day 145, February 15th, 2023, I sent an email to the person who interviewed us requesting an update. No email response. The investigation report is also dated February 15th. The postmark date of the envelope is dated February 21st, 2023, 151 days. On day 153, February 23rd, 2023, I received the letter. The others received their letter in the days following. Um, I'm the next speaker, and I'm ceding my time to student. March 3rd was the deadline written in the letter for us to review, to email a review or written response. This contradicts the, you are provided 10 business days to review written in the letter. Over the next few days, parents of the girls called the number written in the letter to call with any questions and emailed them wondering if we could have longer to process the information. No response. 
Spring track starts. On March 3rd, a few others and I sent emails we spent quite some time on and ended with, please respond to this email as soon as possible, confirming you've received it. No response. March 13th, 10 days later, my dad emailed the DPS chief of staff asking for a response, day 171. March 14th, day 172, I was copied on the DPS chief of staff's email requesting a meeting with the case investigator and the lead Title IX coordinator on the email I sent. It took an adult speaking up for something to happen. April 14th, one month since the last time we heard anything back. Yet we still see the perpetrator at practices and at school. It's been 29 weeks, and today, April 20th, 2023, it is day 210. How many more days will it take? We need a more timely process. The way that the system currently is, it wears the complainants who are victims of sexual harassment out, so they drop the case. This is not due process, nor is it fair. I understand that our state school system is underfunded and that the need of our students is greater than resources given by the state. However, Durham Public Schools prides itself on a commitment to equity, holistic education, and student empowerment. Until DPS steps up to create systems with timely processes that include the complainants, actively protects students, helps victims of sexual assault heal from their trauma, and prevents further cases, DPS is failing its commitment to its students. Thank you for waiting for me to finish my five minute speech. We've waited for 60,480 times the duration of my speech and we still continue to wait. Uh, thank you, students, for your bravery and sharing your story tonight or sharing that story tonight. I'm going to ask our administrators to follow up with you all. Um, they're heading into the hallway now to make sure we can follow up. All right. Next is Katie Martin and Sophia Rett. Rich. Hello. I will be talking about the same situation that student A talked about. I'm student B. I'm 17 years old, a junior at Jordan, and I will be talking about the inadequacy of the no contact policy DPS put into place, attempting to respond to the sexual assault report that six girls on the cross country team reported over 210 days ago. The purpose of a no contact order is to ensure an identified party complainant or respondent has no contact directly or indirectly with another identified party following a report of prohibited conduct. However, these are different from restraining orders as the school was in charge of creating the terms rather than governmental policies. We as complainants were never shown the terms and contract of this order or signed off on them and continue to see and run past the assaulter every single day at practice. At practices, even as hard as we would try to stay away from him, we would all still have to pass by him during laps on the track. It was either that or slow our running and ruin our practice time. I would dread going to practice because of this indirect contact with the assaulter, but I held out hope that the Title IX policy and district would help us. Time went on and all that changed was that we received weird looks from our teammates who inevitably heard what had happened. The assaulter would stare at us now instead of touch us. I still felt sick to my stomach having to see him every single day at practice and continued to feel sick since the assaulter stayed on the team all through the cross country season. I tried to do winter track, but yet again, I felt the perpetrator's eyes on me. This was too much for me to go through another season and I switched to play lacrosse during the spring rather than face another track season with an assaulter. I also know I'm not the only one who was traumatized seeing him at practices. This affects many of the girls on the team, those who have been sexualized by him and those who know how he's been to us, both feel uncomfortable on our own team. If this happens in class, our schedules would get changed and there would be no connections to the assaulter. However, in sports, all they did was make him stand farther away from us, which incited stares. And I will be ceding my time to her. On the other hand, if there is a gun threat, the school takes immediate action and goes into lockdown because guns cause harm and are dangerous. And if there's a physical fist fight, students are immediately dealt with and removed from campus. But in our case, according to DPS policy, if there's a sexual assault report, it will take months to address if it even gets addressed. Why? Why are these three scenarios not all seen as violence, harm, and worth addressing? Why is it okay for some accused of assaulting a student sexually to continue walking around campus, but not someone accused of physically assaulting a student? We need to expand our understanding of harm to include all the ways our students are being harmed and use policies DPS has to support students fully. Sexual violence is still violence and deserves the same level of urgency, attention, and care. 
We have a solution. We're asking for regarding no contact policies. Since we are a restorative justice district, we need to make sure we have a restorative justice no contact order. We need to make sure everybody is comfortable with the terms. We need to make a paper form of a no contact policy and require parties involved to sign them and be held accountable. Yeah, you still have time. Um, I would just like to add, um, I had a different case last year of a person who sexually and physically assaulted me at school. And even though he got suspended for 10 days, I still have to see them in the halls every day. And he's in the musical at Jordan. So I can't go to the musical without feeling very triggered. And I just, I don't feel like it's fair that I should be having to see his face every day because it keeps, I just keep reliving that trauma and I can't get away from it. And yesterday I saw a girl who was talking to him. And today I had to send a message to her just to warn her that he's a really bad person. And yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Aster Schmidl and Annabelle Masinic. Sorry, give me a second to pull up my speech. I'm sorry. It's okay, take your time. All right, um, I'm gonna have to go pretty fast. I'm sorry. Um, what would feel like an ideal school system? Uh, I'm student C, I'm sorry. <laughs> what would an ideal school system look like where all students felt safe from things like sexual violence? In a school system that makes everyone feel safe, we need to focus more on students' needs to be respected. School systems around the country could offer students more resources in order to feel protected in their learning, learning environments. One example recommended by the CDC's What Works in Schools tools Toolkit is a more complete and formal health education. Right now, many health classes are missing any conversation on healthy versus unhealthy relationships, sexual harassment, sexual assault, consent, or and or boundaries. Ensuring these conversations are in every health class in DPS would reduce sexual violence and aid in the fair treatment of those who are victims of sexual crimes. The CDC has resources on what a comprehensive sex uh, health and sex education should include, and they have research proving it helps reduce all forms of violence and other negative outcomes like substance abuse. We also should all be taught how to respond when a friend or peer comes forward with an experience of sexual assault. Adults also need to be taught how to respond appropriately. This must be in every health class as well, since it makes a healthy school in a, in a healthy community. Not only do we need to do this education for the students enrolled in our schools, it also needs to be extended to the teachers. If teachers were required to have knowledge regarding how to teach consent in their classes and what signs may constitute harassment or assault, it would be easier for teachers to uphold policies and recognize instances, instances occurring inside of classrooms, halls, and other areas within schools. With this education for teachers, we can address how sexual perpetrators receive consequences and how we can give them repercussions for their doings rather than turning a blind eye to these severe issues. We can also use restorative justice to make sure students who come forward with claims feel safe, supported, and valued, which makes them feel more connected to their school. Accountability in a school district teaches all students that they are responsible for their actions and they cannot get away with harming each other. Overall, we are here tonight. We here tonight want schools where we feel safe, supported, and recognized in our struggles. Oh. <laughs> I'd like to see my time to student seat. With these issues, and we want action to be taken against the perpetrators. When reporting to adults, the process should be made easier and less intimidating. Every student should know where to report and how to report. To do this, we must receive education on what our rights regarding the reporting process are and what reporting entails. Looking at the cases detailed in the earlier speeches, we were not given information in a timely manner. In, ideal, in an ideal school district, investigating reports of sexual violence has to have the same urgency as investigating, investigating reports of other forms of violence like fighting. Also, reporting sexual violence takes a lot of courage and being left in silence during the process is totally unfair. An ideal school district has advocates for students involved in the process to answer questions and connect them to mental health resources. Right now, our counselors are overworked and have higher caseloads than they should. An ideal school district would spend money on non-police supports like more therapists and restorative justice counselors to make change through understanding rather than through punishment and violence. In your packets, we have more resources for you on what makes an ideal school district and are happy to help to be a part of student feedback and how to make it happen. There should be packets that we'll pass out later. But thank you. Bye. Next, you can come on up. Good 
Good evening to Dr. Mimbenga and the members of the board. Um, you can call me student D. I am a freshman at Jordan High School. And today, me and the other three speakers represent Jordan High School's Club for Students Against Sexual Harassment, or SASH. Based on the experience, the experiences of the previous three speakers, you can see that this is not an issue to be taken lightly. And we would like to request that educators be put through training, that students be given lessons on healthy relationships in their health classes, and that more resources should overall be provided to enrich the learning environments of DPS students. What if there was a way to reduce suicidal ideation in schools, to reduce prescription drug use, to lower the number of STD diagnoses, to increase the likelihood of students graduating high school and college, and most importantly, to reduce violence in schools. The Center for Disease Control released a study called What Works in Schools that reports that these ideals can be reached when schools are safe and supportive environments, but how do we make schools safer and more supportive? This study lists five ways to improve school outcomes, and I would like to go over these plans with you now. The first and second points are as follows. Quote, providing professional development for teachers, including those who teach sexual health education or on classroom classroom management techniques, unquote, and quote, providing professional development for all school staff on policies and practices that support all youth, including LGBTQ youth, unquote. Every single adult in my building should know what to do when a student reports an incident of sexual assault. Every single adult in my building should know what to do in the case of a lockdown. Every single adult in my building should know what to do when their students come to them for help. Helping students feel more comfortable in schools starts with helping staff become more equipped to, to handle problems. The third idea is, quote, implementing school-based positive youth development programs, including mentorship or le service learning programs, or connecting students to these types of programs in their community. Durham should fund positions for service learning coordinators and mentorship coordinators to expand on such programs that we ha already have locally, such as the Durham Crisis Response Center, NCCU, Duke programs, and um, the Durham Crisis Response Center, NCCU, Duke, and the Durham LGBTQ Youth Center. The school system cannot keep asking their teachers to go above and beyond to enrich their students' learning environments, especially when they're being overworked and underpaid. The fourth point is, quote, establishing and enhancing student-led clubs that support LGBTQ youth, unquote. The Jordan chapter of the SASH Club was only founded by a student at Jordan this year, and we are unaware of any other chapters in Durham or even in North Carolina. While gay straight alliances or spectrum clubs are becoming more and more common in North Carolina, not every DPS school has an organization to aid and assist LGBTQ youth students and therefore not all DPS students are being supported. The fifth point is, quote, sharing information and resources with parents or other primary caregivers about positive parenting practices, including how to talk with adolescents, especially about sex, unquote. While doing research for this presentation on a school computer, I came across an article from restlessnetwork.com called How Sex Ed in the U.S. Perpetuates Rape Culture that posited that sex education in schools directly causes rates of rape and sexual assault to drop but it was blocked by DPS as being part of the pornography category. Sex education should not be censored under the basis of being pornographic. While I completely understand that real pornography should not be available on a school device, it is unacceptable that an article promoting sex positive sex education and showing positive effects of this education is being redacted. All health classes should be open learning environments where students feel comfortable talking about healthy relationships and learning the rules of consent. I learned about STDs in my health class, but not about sex, and the tone surrounding the lessons were always negative. My friend Aster only learned about eating disorders in their health class and sex education was never even brought up. And if we aren't being taught that no means no and that maybe isn't yes, then what are victim, victims of sexual assault supposed to do when they don't have the resources to speak up? Other members of Jordan Sash Club and I want to make a difference, but to make our student, their schools better environments, we need the help of not just the school board, but the whole Durham community. This isn't just a problem at Jordan. It's not a problem with Durham public schools. It's a problem all over the world. And I don't know some of the kids that came here with me today, but we felt the need to join together. All right, um, but we, found, we formed a sense of community due to the lack of protection that we've been given in society. And most of us don't enjoy public speaking, but we support each other and our stories have pushed us to be, tier, to be here in front of you today. Thank you for your time and attention. Good evening and thank you all for considering their stories. It took a lot of courage to come up here and I'm really proud of my students. Um, I'll start this speech and if I don't finish it, I'll send it to you on an email. Um, Sexual harassment is not an issue unique to Durham Public Schools, nor unique to any specific school within DPS. It's a nationwide epidemic, and there's so much data supporting that. Um, however, this form of oppression intersects with racism, classism, ableism, and more. And while we strive as a district to provide a school system countering oppression, we must keep in mind the impacts of sexual harassment and assault on these schools. I have a series of statistics about LGBTQ 
LGBTQ youth, homeless youth, and youth of color and the rates of sexual violence that they experience. But I'm going to give you all a packet because I'm a teacher. So you'll get that. Um, while this issue is not specific to DPS, it is nonetheless impacting our students' health, their safety, our school cultures, and our school's outcomes. Across studies observing the impacts of sexual assault in universities, sexual assault was associated with more academic problems, including lower grade point average, dropping out, and self-regulated learning problems. While there's limited research on the impact of sexual assault in academics in K-12 schools, we can safely say it's negative and not contributing to the environment we strive for at DPS. As we continue to grow and improve our district, we have a chance to become a model school system in terms of combating sexual harassment and assault. And the answers are out there on how to do it. There's no shortage of solutions, but funding positions within DPS to address the issue is the next step. Creating funding for more Title IX coordinators who are not just working on investigating reports, but who are proactively educating all of our students. Creating funding for classes within DPS on things like women's studies and gender studies ensuring comprehensive health education, working with community centers like Durham Grape Crisis Center and CCU and Duke's Women's Centers, creating funding for more restorative practices coordinators instead of continuing to fund positions that promote the use of force, violence, or coercion to control behavior. Thank you so much. Thank you. You can drop the packet on the end and then we'll make sure it gets to everyone. Um, and to the students who came tonight, thank you. We do not respond to public comment, but I do want to say thank you. I hope they're still in the hallway and can hear us. Um, it takes courage, it takes bravery to come and advocate on behalf of the other students in your building. And so I appreciate y'all for coming to share that tonight. Uh, know that we hear you, we hear you. The next speaker is gonna be Karen Ald Alderman. And then Andreas Rivera Rosaric will be following Karen. And please correct me, you all. I'm trying to read handwriting up here. I'm not very good at it. Got it, Chair. You did it. Right on target. <laughs> Hi, I'm Karen Haldeman. Um, I'm a mom. I'm a DPS parent, and I'm a gun violence prevention activist. I sit on the board of North Carolinians Against Gun Violence, and I was a co-chair of the city's first racial equity task force. Um, and I hearing these stories, I wasn't prepared to hear all of these stories today, but it is weaving in very well with this idea of preventing gun violence. It has been an excruciating couple of months in Durham. It's been an excruciating couple of days in our country. And we're all feeling it. I'm feeling it. I was in a Zoom call today and I thought, I don't, I don't, I don't feel, I don't feel good when people ask me how I'm doing. This is, it has been intense and our students are also feeling that intensity. I'm actually here to support the students who are coming in with a petition to ask for more mental health days and for better mental health resources at schools. I met this group online on Twitter, reached out, helped them with the petition. I'd never met them before in my life. I just met them downstairs. I am so impressed. I am so impressed with the young people who came up and told their story just now. Empower, that word, really holds meaning really holds meaning when I see these students come up and tell their stories. The number one risk factor for someone perpetrating violence, and that includes gun violence, is previous history of violence. So what these young women are saying tonight also relates to gun violence and its trajectory. How are we stopping it? How are we mitigating it? How are we preventing it? We are very reactive to the end product, which is tragedy. But their violence is something that happens well before that. In our words, our deeds, and our actions. So I hope that um, you listen to, I know you're listening to all the students. I'm here to support them. I'm here to partner with you. Uh, I'm still pushing for some safe storage programming of firearms, safe storage of firearms. Um, I was here in July asking for that. I hope that that's something that comes true too again. Um, but I have hope. And that's why I'm here today. So thank you. Thank you. Andreas, followed by Matthew Barahana. Good afternoon. My name is Andreas Rivera Rosario. I am 17 years old and I am a student at Durham School of Technology. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of students for mental health. We have two goals. We are asking the school board to make the five state granted remote learning days into mental health days and to also provide students more mental health resources while they're in school. 
the reason why I'm doing this is because as I was a kid, I was taught to leave things better how I found it. And now I believe as I'm a senior in high school, before I leave to college for DPS to be a better place after I leave. Um, mental health is something that has been on a rapid decline, especially since the pandemic. Students, including myself, have to worry about things that students should not have to worry about. The normal stress of high school life, school, homework, part-time jobs, preparing for college and becoming an adult, now on top of that, has the threat of gun violence or another disruption like COVID piled on top of it. Having just five days to rest, relax, and catch up with work they need could help a lot. Research, research shows that 44% of students feel hopeless, sad for weeks on end at a time. And as a student, I could say that a lot of this is caused by stress. A national survey said that 74% of parents think that a mental health day would benefit their child. And 12 states already allow students to take mental health days off. I'd like to close off by saying that mental health is a issue and a crisis and having five days built into the calendar can help us solve this mental health crisis. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Matthew, come on up, and then followed by Abby Corliss. Hello, my name is Matthew Barahona. Hello, my name is Matthew Barahona. I am 17 years old. I am a junior and attend Durham School of Technology. I am speaking on behalf of the Durham Public School Students for Mental Health. We have two goals. We are asking the school board to make the five state granted days by the state, those remote learning days into mental health days, and also to provide students with more mental health resources while they're at school. It's a shame that I go to school and I don't know if I'm in a safe environment or not. School has turned from being a joyful and fun place to learn new things at to being a stressful and dangerous place to be at nowadays. I personally want to see a change in schools and have more attention focused on us, the students, because after all, it is our education and our future. After the shootings and lockdowns in February, we started noticing that students' mental health wasn't in the right place. And we saw that many schools don't have many mental health resources and the students are struggling. That's when we decided to come together and unite as a class and create a group purely focused on the mental health for Durham Public School students. We go by the name DPS Students for Mental Health. This group came together after two hillside students were shot right next to our campus. We started seeing many students and their mental health wasn't at the right place at the right time. And we decided to make surveys to, to the community and release them to see what their opinions were on gun violence, our environment, and our schools in general. Our group decided to focus purely on this because of the mental health aspect, because this is what students struggle on most, whether they are dealing with gun violence or not. Thank you so much for your time. This is Matthew Barahona from the DPS Students for Mental Health. Thank you, Matthew. Next, we have Abby Corliss, followed by Isaiah Palmer. Hello, my name is Abby Corliss, and I'm a sophomore at Durham School of Technology. I am also speaking of, on behalf of DPS Students for Mental Health. Like the previous speaker said, we have two goals. We are asking the school board to make the five state granted remote learning days into mental health days. And we're asking you to provide students with more mental health resources while they're in school. The reason I am here today is because I am frustrated with the lack of consideration for students' mental health. I, like many students in the DPS district, am struggling with the daily pressure and the stress caused by schoolwork and the tragic events that have been happening in and around our schools. We need more support to deal with this and we are asking for your help. Because of the positive survey results we received, which another student will comment on more in depth, we decided to create a petition to illustrate the support for our cause. Our entire class helped distribute the petition by sending out emails, asking students from our school and other schools to sign and going out in public to get signatures. So far, we've gathered over 1300 signatures and more are still being recorded. The majority of those responses came from students at high schools around the district, but we also got support from many parents, educators, and concerned Durham residents. 
This shows the Durham community and the schools in the DPS district are in favor of getting better mental health resources for students and using the mental health days that we have from the state to help students perform better in school and succeed at their goals, whether they be academic or personal. Thank you for your time. Following Isaiah will be Ayan Robinson. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Isaiah Palmer. I'm 17 years old and I'm currently attending Durham School of Technology. I'm speaking on behalf of DPS students for mental health. We have two goals. We are asking the students, we are asking the school board to make the five state granted remote learning days into mental health days and also provide students more mental health resources while they're in school. The reason I am here is because as a student, I see and I witness what my peers go through and I want to tell you, it doesn't look like they can be strong for so, for so long. The day after the shooting, I was a little scared of how DPS schools were just sweeping incidents like this under the rug and just saying, well, it wasn't you, so just go back and do your work and don't speak about it. I don't want these things to be normalized. My main focus today is about mental health resources. Our mental health resources have not been doing as a as good of a job. They should be, especially after COVID. For one, they're not well advertised in our school systems. And what I mean by that is that most students only know about the one guidance counselor assigned to us. We don't know how, we don't know who the social worker is, who the school psychologist is. Since we started this, we've been told that we have a therapist on our campus sometimes. Not a single person in the group had ever even heard of them. This is a major problem when we don't know who these people are. Students should be told this soon as they step foot on campus. Thank you for your time. Go ahead. Good evening. My name is Tyon Robinson. I am a 16 year old junior attending Durham School of Technology. I'm speaking on behalf of DPS students for mental health. We have two main goals. We are asking the school board to make the five state granted remote learning days into mental health days and also provide students with more mental health resources while they are in school. I'm here because suicide, I am here because mental health is a big problem in the society. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in the world for those aged 15 to th through 24 years of age. This is something I want to change. I want to be the difference. Mental health matters. I want to, uh, I want to talk about the survey. One of the first pieces of advice we got when starting our group was that we needed to see how the rest of the community felt about mental health and safety in schools. So we created a survey with three questions. Should we have mental health days? Should we have more mental health resources? And should we start defunding SROs and fund counselors instead? After our survey, we got 650 responses from students, parents, and concerned Durham residents. It was clear that students, teachers, and Durham residents wanted men more mental health days and more mental health resources. So we focused on those two as our goals. After completing the survey, we created a petition to support the wants and needs of the community. It gained a lot of support with people behind us, gaining us 1,300 plus signatures and still counting to this day. This is seen as a need in the community. Something must change. We have to be the difference. Thank you. All right, following him, we have Ayana McKeever, followed by Raquel Scott. My name is Ayanna McKeever. I am 17 years old and a junior at Durham School of Technology. I am speaking on behalf of DPS Students for Mental Health. We have two goals, as was said by the last people. We are asking the school board to make the five state granted remote learning days into mental health days and also provide more students white with more mental health resources in their school. The reason this matters to me is because I am a high school student. I am still a child. Um, 
and going through tra tragic events and having to come back the next day and being forced to do work and just forget about things that happen is something I don't want to get used to. In my opinion, I think it's time to snap into reality and realize that traumatic events aren't going to stop. So we need to do we need to step forth and do something before it happens. Not only is it tra tra traumatizing and effective to my mental health, like all students, I have my personal events going on, and that's not making it better. And for school to supposed to be a safe place, it doesn't feel like it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Come on up, Raquel, followed by Joshua Rand and Kiara Ross will be following Joshua. Good evening. My name is Raquel Scott. I am 17 years old and I attend Girl School in Technology. I am speaking on the behalf of DPS students for mental health. We have two goals. We are asking the school board to make the five state granted remote learning days into mental health days and also provide students mental health, mental health resources while they're in school. Here's why I'm doing this. These shootings in the area are rising dramatically and once these shootings happen, people start worrying about if they're safe or if it's their family or friend that is being shot. Worrying about that can heavily impact on that person's mental health. I'm here to talk about why we should have these mental health days. Students and teachers have a lot going on in their personal lives, and for them to be worrying about school can be stressful. And that's where the mental health, mental health days come in. The district have five remote days that they use for weather, but when, those, when we don't use those days, those days are, are wasted. So those days will still be count as a school day. Students will complete an assignment for attendance, but that day will be more dedicated to that person's mental health. Thank you for your time. Good evening. Uh, my name is Joshua Rand, and I'm 16. I also attend the school of Durham School of Technology. I am speaking on behalf of DPS students for mental health. We have two goals. We are asking the school board to make the five state granted remote learning days into mental health days and also provide students more mental health resources while they're in school. I am here today because things going on with students and their mental health and the tragic losses our schools have had is so frustrating. And we, we have to keep going through the same things over and over. So I wanna help make change for our schools so the students can have better conditions and our mental health is good. I am I am suffering mentally and my friends are also, I'm just asking for y'all's help. Thank you for your time. Good evening. My name is Kiera. I'm a 16 year old student that attends Durham School of Technology. I'm speaking on behalf of DPS Students for Mental Health. We have two goals. We are we are asking the school board to make the five state granted remote learning days into mental health days and also provide students more mental health resources while they're in school. One thing I'm always told is that I'm a student first. I should feel safe, like I can speak my mind and be able to feel at ease and less stressed all of, by all of these things coming my way, but I don't. It's unfortunate to know not only students, but also teachers and parents feel this way. After all, I have an obligation to come to this place every day. Nothing has changed despite years of discussion on this topic. In fact, things are actively becoming worse. After a few months of discussion, me and my team really grasped the fact that we really don't know what our mental health resources are. And if we do have them, they're either unknown by the students or there isn't enough to get the job done. We've had plenty of speakers come in explaining multiple resources inside our school, and they were shocked by us completely not knowing what they were. And these are just the resources inside of our school alone. So imagine all of the DPS students struggling and not even knowing that the help is available to them. All in all, even if we can't get more resources, please help us make sure that the ones that are available are actively known and effective for our school system, our school community, be it a student, a teacher, or a parent, can be provided to help, uh, to help us strive. Thank you. Laura Sartain is the last speaker that signed up, but I do want to just make sure if there's anyone else that had something to share, they have an opportunity. Laura Sartain.
on it. Ms. Sartain, before you say something, I just want to say something because I think the students are still in the hallway and maybe yeah, getting ready to leave. But uh, I just want to again say thank you, students, for coming and sharing your voices. Um, Y'all, my brain is in so many different places thinking of ideas of how we support our students tonight. So I just want to say thank you all to the DPS um, mental health, students for mental health. I'm sorry. There you go, Ms. Sartain. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Lauren Sartain. Um, I am a DPS parent of two children at our neighborhood Title I elementary school. Um, but first, I just wanted to say how brave all the students who came and talked tonight are. I'm incredibly, incredibly proud of those young people and also incredibly sad that they're here having to advocate for these things. And so, well, I'll be looking to see how the district follows up with them. Um, I'm here tonight to continue to push for increased transparency around um, district policymaking, priority setting, and the budgeting process. Our public schools in Durham are hanging on by a thread. I see the educators in our school building getting pulled to sub when teachers are out. They're working as reading interventionists on top of their actual positions. They're staying after school with kids whose parents couldn't sec secure childcare or pick them up by 2.15. And they're doing all this extra work without being compensated. DPS educators are exhausted. Tonight, DPS is presenting their next strategic plan for your consideration. We need to think about this plan as a contract between the district, parents, students, and their educators. The goals are worthy, we should have high expectations, but the district has not shown how resources will be increased. If we keep following the same old plan, this one looks very similar to the last one, we won't see any changes unless more resources are allocated to schools. I ask that you not vote on the plan until DPS shows you and the public how they plan to accomplish their goals. We need resources, but when I look at the district's budget proposal, what I see is position cuts coming. School staff allocations are tied to student enrollment and the district is projecting enrollment declines in many schools without any public information about how these projections are made. Projections aren't just numbers, they represent school budgets, teachers' jobs, and students' learning. The projected enrollment declines also ignore the important fact that DPS's neighborhood schools enroll students throughout the entire school year. Our school now serves 40 students more than they did at the beginning of the year, and we suffered position cuts this year. Our kindergarten classes are large and they don't have dedicated IAs. We have a school, we are a school that serves approximately 80 English learners with one EL position allocated to our school. These working conditions are going to continue to push educators out and they're harmful to children. I'm asking for more transparency around budgeting and ask you to continue or consider holding schools harmless for times. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That concludes our public comments. All right. The next item on our agenda is our consent items. We have several items that have been presented to the board in advance of this meeting tonight. Um, board members. Move approval of the consent agenda. Second. It's been moved by Ms. Rogers, seconded by Ms. Byer. Any other, any other discussion? Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please use the same sign. Passes unanimously. The next item on our agenda is a Board of Education item, Day of Remembrance Re Resolution. I'm gonna pass it over to Ms. Lewis to lead us through. Is that okay? The Day of Remembrance was presented to this board at our work session and a committee was formed and on April 13th, we met to draft this resolution. The intent was to continue to show support and unity for, for our youth, safety and wellness. The outline that you'll see presented before you was intended to be drafted by the Board of Education, City Council and the County Commission Commissioners. So the first two paragraphs that you see as whereas were statements made by the Board of Education. The next two statements were made by the County Commissioners. And the next two statements were from City Council, all giving input to this resolution. We all gave one therefore of what we would do and then the Board of Education took the liberty to do one more <laughs> at the very end. Two, we posted the draft that was done, and then we had a few more edits. You know, we do group work and collaborations. People 
bring things along around, you know, past the deadline. So in the second, let me pull it up. In the one, two, three, fourth paragraph, the second sentence that highlights a um, data share by the Durham police, um, that sentence was added. That was not originally on our um, posted resolution. Along with uh, one, two, three, four, the fifth paragraph, the very last sentence did not reflect um, what we wanted to just make sure was was true to our community and our school community that violence had been in the community and our students are affected. So we um, reworded with the city. This was the city statements where the city reworded that. They shared this um, resolution at their city council meeting earlier today at one and and now it's on our board agenda to review. And I turn it back to you, Chair Amstead, how you'd like to proceed. Thank you, Ms. Lewis, for bringing this resolution and the work that you've done. Um, I know all of our bodies are pretty busy. <laughs> and so I know that uh, working with all the different bodies to get this together probably was not an easy feat. So I appreciate you for doing that coordination and collaboration. Um, board members, I'm going to ask if y'all have any other questions or edits um, so we can discuss that and then read the resolution. I had um, such appreciation for um, Ms. Lewis taking the lead on this and appreciate you coordinating such um, excellent work between the three bodies. I did wonder in the second, whereas if we should pluralize Durham Public Schools rather than just school. And then the very last we get further resolved, it doesn't have a Durham in front of city council. And I wondered if it was stronger with them actually called the Durham city council there. Those were the only things that I noted. Um, I thought you might wanna consider, but thank you so much for your leadership on this. Any other questions or edits? Just have a comment. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, I want to thank my colleague, board member Giovanni Lewis, for taking the lead with the resolution and um, share that the Latin 19 um, group that met this Wednesday also got to see this resolution and we got to read it there as well. Um, and lots of comments just in, in terms of support and, and families, just stakeholders, a, a lot of um, just comments about like how important this work is and acknowledging. Um, you know, the loss and also like the things that we're doing and we're putting forth in terms of collaboration to address the issues. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Carter Alton. Um, <clears throat> just briefly, not to keep us longer than we will be this evening, but I also wanted to express my um, appreciation for all of the work that went into this. As others have stated, this um, is, I'm sure, a enormous task to collaborate, but also so important to have these, all of these different entities working together as it's gonna take all of us to address this immense task of um, reducing gun violence. I also really love that this, um, that pieces of this uh, um, honor the lives lost, lost and the, and those that are experiencing the losses, but also bring together um, evidence-based strategies like gun locks and, um, sharing data and research and working to invest in communities that have long been, you know, faced disinvestment. So I think I, I love the final product of this and I am very appreciative of all the work that went into it. So thank you to all those who put their time and energy into this. Any other questions or edits? All right. Hearing none. I I have a few, I've read this several times and every time I read it, just a couple, if we put Durham Public Schools Board of Education in there. There's um, in the last paragraph and eight, yeah, and the, yeah, from there on the eighth paragraph, just so we get Durham Public Schools Board of Education in there. 
Yes, in the last be further resolved, and the first now therefore it be resolved. Durham Public Schools, yeah. Mm -hmm. Durham Public Schools. I'll start with Ms. Rogers and we will read. Day of Remembrance Resolution. Whereas according to the National Association of School Psychologists, high profile acts of violence, particularly in schools, can confuse and frighten children who may feel in danger or worry that their friends or loved ones are at risk. They will look to the adults for information and guidance on how to react. Parents and school personnel can help children feel safe by establishing a sense of normalcy and security and talking with them about their fears. Whereas the recent acts of violence in the community have directly impacted Durham youth who attend Durham public schools, and we uphold our strategic plan to support the whole child in which we are committed to create and implement tiered support that provides standardized intervention strategies designed to address students' social, emotional, and behavioral needs. Whereas Durham County Health and Human Services seeks to strengthen our communities by advancing health, safety, and opportunity, including preventing injury and death by promoting the use of gun locks, encouraging responsible gun ownership, sharing data and research to develop effective policies and partnerships to reduce gun violence. Whereas the firearms amplify violence and contribute to a growing public health burden as a leading cause of fatalities and injuries with more than 100 Americans killed by gun violence each day. Durham Police Department shared the latest data that 58% of guns stolen, 58% of guns stolen are stolen out of cars and 61% of those cars were unlocked. We encourage all Durham residents to support their local community's efforts to prevent the tragic effects of gun violence and to honor and value human lives and help educate their communities about safe storage of firearms in the home, to raise awareness about gun violence and honor the lives of gun violence victims and survivors. Whereas the city of Durham pays tribute honors and remembers gun violence victims and lends support to survivors and family members. It is a fact every person in neighborhood needs and deserves safety. To counteract gun violence, the city of Durham is leveraging a collaboration between law enforcement, violence and crisis intervention and social services for places long experiencing structural racism, disinvestment and high rates of gun violence to numerous neighborhoods and public venues affecting our community, and in particular, our youth. Whereas we hereby call on Durham residents, PAC members, local businesses, and nonprofit organizations, along with community and youth groups, to consciously push back against the marketing and lobbying activities of the firearms industry and gun lobby by encouraging state and federal elected officials to advocate in support of background checks for every firearm sale, pass safe storage legislation, and ban assault weapons. No more silence and gun violence. Now, therefore, be it resolved, Durham Board of Education emphasizes that it is all of our responsibility to ensure Durham's future by acknowledging where we are, remember those we have lost, and supporting the wellness of those who have been impacted. This can only be achieved when everyone in the Durham community works collectively and intentionally to embody our highest aspirations for our children. Be it further resolved in recognition of Durham's Day of Remembrance, the Durham Board of County Commissioner renews our commitment to reduce gun violence, pay tribute to the innocent victims of gang violence, and pledge to do all we can to keep firearms out of the wrong hands and encourage responsible gun ownership to help keep our children safe. Be it further resolved that the Durham City Council is committed to enhancing public safety through a community-centered approach that supports families and devises policy to confront historical harms while promoting community-based safety and wellness and 
Be it further resolved that the Durham Public Schools Board of Education, Durham Board of County Commission, and Durham City Council call upon the United States Congress and the North Carolina General Assembly to prioritize the protection of youth, families, and our communities by passing legislation that more effectively regulates access to firearms in the interest of public safety, funds public health research on firearms related issues, and advances mental health supports. Signed, giving that to you, Madam Chair. Uh, it'll be signed by Bettina Umstead, DPS Board of Education Chair. D um, Brenda Howerton, Chair of Durham County Commissioners, and Elaine O'Neill, Mayor of Durham. Thank you. Uh, I'll take a motion. Or is there any other discussion? Oh, I'll just say while we wait for this motion, um, you know, reading this about how we need safety and more laws regulating weapons and guns, and knowing that our General Assembly is moving in a different direction. Um, think holds that weight that we've all maybe been feeling this um and our public speaker talked about the kind of just sadness in many ways we know we need these protections to help protect our children to protect our communities and we see people actively moving in a different direction and that just that feels harmful in a different type of way i move approval of the day of remembrance resolution Second. It's been moved by Ms. Chavez, seconded by Ms. Fire. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. And any opposed, please use the same sign. It passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. If I could just um, share, thank you all. Um, next steps for a day of remembrance. Just remembering is continued show of unity to support youth safety and wellness. A day of remembering that we belong and we are all accepted. A time to reflect and remember what is great about our lives and the lives of our loved ones. The same way that we practice fire drills and practice lockdowns, a moment of silence is an opportunity to teach our children to pause, breathe, and reflect when sometimes we don't have a moment's rest in all this chaos that's around us. A moment of silence supports one's mental wellness. This day was incited by violence in our community while the heart of this work is to see the humanity in each other and to be well. I appreciate all the support for the committee coming together. We will set another date to plan what May 15th Day of Remembrance looks like with the agenda, rereading the resolution and going forth with the board members concerns that have been noted in our previous meeting and we'll continue to discuss it in our update upcoming committee meetings that will be publicly noted, noticed and notes will be taken. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Uh, Ms. Bagadaris. Thank you. And I just wanted to also mention that um, in speaking to um, families who have children who attend high schools and, and a lot of constituents, you know, there's there's so many ideas that the community has. And I, I know that we're all ears, right? So um, I just wanted to put out some of the um, suggestions from from uh, uh, one parent who was talking about Riverside High School and being so close to the river and if there's any um, anybody from the Riverside community who feels like maybe a walk is in place this is something that I'm just you know sharing based on on um, families who are also interested in in doing activities or also by the ATC trail by Hillside and on April 22nd which is a Saturday having messages of love um, especially for Earth Day um, with chalk. And so there's ways that, you know, as board members, we're going to be talking about activities, but if there are school communities that want to organize their own um, actions, I mean, this is this is definitely something that we support as um, as as just, first of all, as, as constituents of this community. I mean, we are a part of this community. And so um, just letting you all know, whatever uh, events happen at the school that you feel this is how you want to do it, let us know. But we're also going to be meeting, and, and I thank you so much, um, board member colleague Giovanni Lewis for leading us on on some actions and we'll be discussing some more about activities. Thank you. Thank you all. We're going to move to our next item, operation services. We've got our annual comprehensive financial report. 
We'll pass it over to Mr. Lesore. Members, Dr. Mabenga, uh, tonight we bring to you uh, summary information of our financial audit for the 21-22 school year. This brings closure to that year. It brings uh, with great pleasure uh, my staff, administration, the schools have participated in making this happen. It's not a one person show, it's, a, it's all of us and we are one. Uh, so tonight I thank all of them for all that they did in the 21-22 school year and beyond uh, for us to have a clean audit. Tonight, I have Mr. Paul Carson, who is a partner in the firm of Anderson, Smith & White, that will provide you with an overview of our financial situation uh, as we moved into this year. And uh, he is a Durham graduate. He was here. He <laughs> went through 12 years of schooling here, uh, has moved on. And as you can see, he's doing well for himself. <laughs> being a partner in the firm. So I wanna bring to bring you up here uh, to go over the financials, Paul Carson. Good evening board members, Dr. Mabanga. Hope you're all doing well. Um, thank you for allowing our firm to perform your audit this year. Um, I think each of you should have already received an electronic copy of the June 30th, 2022 audited financial statements. The annual comprehensive financial report is fairly lengthy. It's over 130 pages. So each of you should have received a short 13 page financial statement summary report. Um, that is what we will be going over this evening. Um, it summarizes the areas of the financial statements uh, that we feel are the most important uh, to you in overseeing the finances and budget for the uh, school district. If anyone has any questions as I go through, please don't hesitate to interrupt and, and stop me and we can address those. But our audit basically covers two main areas. We perform an audit of the actual finances of the school system, which includes um, the amounts you see in the report, as well as an audit of the school system's compliance with state and federal laws and regulations, which primarily relates to the state and federal funding um, that y'all receive. Uh, within the detailed financial statement, there are four letters we uh, issued pertaining to these audit areas. Uh, the four letters are summarized on the first page of the summary you received. On pages one through three of the detailed report um, is our financial statement opinion letter, which, as uh, Mr. Lazor uh, alluded to, was a clean, unmodified opinion. Uh, that is exactly what you want to receive. This means that the numbers and disclosures provided in the report are reliable and the financial statements are free from any material misstatements. Um, the internal control and compliance letter is found on pages 96 through 97. We do not issue an opinion on internal controls, but we do report on any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies that may be detected. Um, and we're happy to report that there were no such items detected uh, as a result of our audit. And then there's a report on major, the major federal and state programs, and that's on pages 98 through 103. And that those both are clean, unmodified opinion letters. Um, there are a lot of various compliance steps we're required to test. We're required, we were required to perform more extensive tests again this year uh, due to the federal COVID funding that the district received. We select a significant amount of payroll and general expenditure uh, transactions for testing. So to have no findings, um, that require repayment of grant funds reflects very highly on the quality of work by the finance staff, um, as well as the department heads and staff in the other areas in which we um, were required to audit. Um, now, next, we'll look at, we'll move on to some financial information, which starts on page two of the uh, summary report. And this page is the, um, is a three-year summary of the local current expense fund. Uh, it shows the assets, liabilities, and fund balance, as well as a three-year summary of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. And all of these amounts in this report come from the audited financial statements. But ending cash balances were $24.5 million, which comprised the majority of the fund's total assets, which were uh, $24.8 million at June 30th, 2022, 
uh, liabilities totaled six point three million, and assets minus liabilities give you the district's fund balance, which was eighteen million four seventy eight three seventy two, which was an increase of about one point nine million over the prior year. And you can see the bottom of uh, that first column, the bottom of the page uh, for the increase. Uh, one point five million dollars of the fund balance was has been allocated to help uh, balance the current year, the twenty two twenty three budget. Um, overall, the local current expense fund appears to have an adequate level of fund balance and cash reserves at June thirtieth, twenty twenty two, for a district of this size. Uh, fund balance and cash reserves are needed for cash flow purposes, um, and emergency or other unforeseen needs um, that could potentially arise. There are some charts on pages three, four, and five that show a visual comparison um, of the cash balances, fund balances, the fund balance and revenues and expenditures uh, for the past three years. Does anybody have any questions on this fund before I move on? Okay. The next page we'll look at will be page six. And much like the, um, the previous page, this is the local special expense fund. And uh, this, this fund has both restricted and unrestricted revenues that flow through it. Some of the unrestricted revenues include sales tax refunds, indirect cost, interest income. The fund reported a decrease of fund balance of approximately $730,000 to end the year with $2.7 million of fund balance. Now, the next page we'll move on to is the, there's the very next one, page seven. And this is the capital outlay fund. Uh, the fund reported revenues of $67.3 million, expenditures of $65.3 uh, million, and other financing sources of $753,000. Uh, for the year, the fund balance increased um, $2.7 million to end the year at $8.9 million. Are there any questions? Okay. And moving along to the next page, we'll look at page eight, and that's our school food service fund. The, the program reported a net profit for the year of $3.4 million compared to a profit of $1.2 million in the prior year. And that improvement in profitability was primarily due to the increase in food sales and USDA revenues received as the district returned to more normal operations uh, during the 22 uh, fiscal year. And uh, the program had cash balances at the end of the year of $5.8 million, which was good to see. And uh, again, there's a chart on page nine that shows the visual comparison um, of cash balances, revenues, expenditures, and net income or loss. Are there any questions? Okay. And um, also, on, so starting on page eleven through what's well, eleven through thirteen, the last three pa or the last three pages, we're required to issue a separate report um, that details specific audit items that we're required to communicate to the board about. The letter basically just has boilerplate language, and it discusses that there were no difficulties or disagreements encountered in dealing with management during the audit. Um, but overall, this letter lets you know that there were no reportable issues were noted during the audit. And I did want to let you know that we do perform uh, detailed testing of receipts and disbursements at uh, the end for the individual schools. We noted no significant issues during that testing, and it appears that the school bookkeepers are doing a good job. Um, we typically note minor areas where improvement can be made during our uh, audits of the schools, um, you know, whether it's in testing or other operational areas. And usually these uh, comments relate to best practices and we, that we've seen from other districts that we audit and that we think may maybe make those, imp or those improvements can be made to the district's, um, to the district's current controls and procedures. Um, we always try to communicate these best practices and recommendations to management for them to share with the principals, bookkeepers, and other relevant staff within the district. But overall, we felt that the books and records were found to be in excellent order. Um, it appears that management is spending funds um, in accordance with budgets approved by the Board of Education. And everyone we, everyone we dealt with was very transparent, easy to work with uh, throughout the entire audit process which is always good to see. And I will note that is not the case everywhere. And um, I think the finance department did a great job maximizing state positions, uh, dollar allotments, which is something that we always look for. Um, I think Mr. LeJour and his department continue to do an excellent um, job of managing the finances of the district and giving you all accurate, timely information, which is what's important in the financial decisions you have to make. 
Um, I'd like to thank him and his staff for helping us get through the audit and have every, everything well organized for us. Um, you, you all definitely have a very well run finance department. Um, but are there any questions for me before we wrap up? Board members, any questions? Ms. Byer? Thank you. It's always great to um, get a clean audit and it's always great to actually celebrate it because it is not the case across the state. Let's just be real clear, just because it is always the case here with our team in Durham, it's due to their diligent um, work and leadership and thoroughness. And so great to celebrate um, your former math teacher here <laughs> and the great impact he had on your uh, life trajectory. Um, I always like to talk a little bit about fund balance, and while it's good to see it growing, I, I just like you to publicly kind of remind other folks that might ask us where a healthy fund balance would be. I don't think it's quite there yet, but I, I'm hoping that we can continue to gently nudge that up to cover our needs. Well, I will say, you know, we there is no, there, there's not really a guidance for you know, a recommended fund balance. Um, you know, we always point out that the LGC, the Local Government Commission, will, um, you know, they, they require or recommend 8% of their expenditures. So if you were to look at that just in, just in fund, uh, your fund two or your local uh, current expense fund, that would mean a fund balance of approximately $12.7 million. Um, you know, and that would be unassigned fund balance. So, you know, y'all are currently at about $9.6 million. Um, but one thing, you know, we always try to harp on, especially this year and come with this COVID money. One thing we saw in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis was after after that, and very similar to what they what has been happening now, the federal government sending out a lot of fund funds to you, you know, to all the districts across the country. And what that ends up lead, led to was obviously inflation, higher cost, and and once those um, are spent then there's no more money than you're going to have to, um, you know, make up that difference somewhere. So that is something we always, you know, we're, you know, basically advising all boards to try to accumulate uh, fund balance as much as possible to, so that they can more easily deal with rising costs, you know, whether it comes from retirement expenses, healthcare, um, things of that nature, utilities, whatnot. Um, so that is something that we've been cautioning all boards to, just understand that, you know, once that funding stops, then that's when, you know, some of those decisions will have to be made. So, Thank you. We, I think we know there are difficult uh, decisions you. coming as we get near the end of this federal um, COVID funding. Also on the school food service, I'm just trying to remember the timeline. This 2022 budget cycle still had the federal government covering all students. Yes, Is that right? Yes, but that was before they ended the policy of free lunch. No, it was free lunch for yeah. everybody. Was yeah, yeah, the yeah. entire 23 or the 22, 21, 22 year. And then, so when you compare to the prior year, obviously schools were, you know, shut down. That's why you can see food sales drop from 1.7 million in 2020 to, to only $181,000 in 21. And this year they're back up a little bit because there is, you know, there are some sales going on, but for the most part, you're correct. The That's why the USDA funding you see is, is about, you know, $6 million higher than last year because of the USDA covering all of the meals for all the students. Which could be a North Carolina legislation that could be taken up with free meals for all, but until they do, I know it's something that Mr. Lejeur is watching carefully and a little concerned about. So I just like to make sure I keep that straight. But thank you so much for your leadership with us. Other questions? Well, we really do appreciate again you all allowing our firm to perform the audit and we look forward to working with you uh y'all again next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation and, and a huge thank you again to our finance staff and bookkeepers and all the different folks who are able to make that a clean audit, which we appreciate. The next item on our agenda is the school, Durham School of Arts Construction Manager at Risk Selection. I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Monk and Mr. Davis. All right, and good evening, uh, board chair and members of the Board of Education, Dr. Mabanga. Uh, Mr. Davis is gonna provide us with an update for the construction management at risk recommendation for pre-construction services contract for the new Durham School of the Arts. Thank you, Dr. Monk. Good evening. 
Greetings, board members, Chair Umstead, Dr. Mabinga. Uh, quickly, I'm gonna go through uh, the process again and share with the public um, why we have selected this method of delivery uh, and then provide you a staff recommendation uh, for the selection of the CM for Durham School of the Arts. Uh, next slide, please. Just to reorient, reorient you to uh, the selection, again, this board decided instead of renovating the existing Durham School of the Arts, uh, we would design a new state-of-the-art, truly uh, conducive to School of the Arts uh, site, uh, about five miles uh, north of the existing site, uh, which is on 93 acres. We, based on NCDPI standards, are truly uh, comprehensive or School of the Arts high school should be about 30 acres. And so we managed to bring it down to 40 acres that we would be disturbing um, just to give uh, credence to why we decided to move to, or the board's decision to move to a new site. Uh, next site, please. So again, uh, this board roughly two years ago decided to go to uh, a new method that a lot of public entities are using to ensure fiscal responsibility, on-time delivery, uh, and enhancing our MWBE participation. This is just a quick uh, synopsis of why uh, this delivery method is chosen now than the traditional design bid build method. This also allows us to provide uh, uh, real-time um, construction dollars so that there, there are no uh, unforeseen cost escalations as well as uh, putting packages together to again um, provide minorities a chance to bid on these projects. Uh, next slide, please. And so here is a timeline of the process. We put out an RFQ uh, throughout the state to interested CM firms. Uh, we then narrowed down that process and had interviews. Uh, as you see in the prices document, uh, interviews selected were from uh, in house as well as exterior. Uh, public and private partnerships to give a true depiction of what it is that we wanted from our CM firm. Next slide, please. And so here are some of the criteria that we uh, use to select uh, to get to the interview process. Again, uh, one of the big uh, proponents of this board as well as our administration is to make sure that we are community led with a local participation as well as minority uh, underutilized businesses. Uh, again, the firms that we were selected for the short list, make sure you had a, a conducive and experience with pre-construction services, meaning before the project is bid, making sure uh, through working with the design team, um, it is constructible and providing us uh, real-time evidence on can this truly be built on time and on budget. And then we looked at the experience of the project team, as well as innovative construction ideas, such as using technology, uh, to provide us making sure there's no conflicts with mechanical, plumbing, or electrical. Next slide, please. And so we did, um, due to this market, um, shortlist only two firms. We did reach out to those firms that we've worked with in the past, uh, and based on their information that we received, this market uh, is very, very high, and a lot of the firms that we would like to engage with just did not have the bonding capacity or the time commitments uh, to uh, solicit for this project. But we did go through the public bid process and we did understand this market, be it public or private, there's a lot of growth here. And so this is why we present to you two selections, uh, Balfour Beatty and Monteith, along with Wright Build International, as well as Samet, along with WC Construction. Uh, next slide, please. And so based on that criteria, uh, staff recommends uh, the board enter into negotiations for the CM work for the new Durham School of the Arts with Monteith Balfour Construction in association with Wright Bill. Um, you may not know, but Monteith just finished uh, Lions Farm in the height of COVID with literally just a 3% change order report. Generally, anything over five or six is, is not good. And so we're happy to be closing out that project with a 3% change or report in the middle of COVID. Um, of course, we've worked with Right Build and helping us with our minority participation. And as you see uh, from the slide here, Balfour Beatty is a leader of the state, internationally and nationally known in public school education and on the high school level. Next slide. With that, we'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Questions from board members?
motion from board members if there are no questions. I'll start us off. I, we've been using the construction risk, construction manager at risk model for a little bit now. And I believe I know the answer to this, but could you just speak to a little bit about how that's helping you all complete projects? I think, I know I'm glad to see projects be completed on time and not outside of the budget, but are there any other things you wanna share? It's primarily uh, the main benefit is getting the contractor on board early in the design process. Uh, in the traditional method, uh, there may be some unforeseen conditions that you don't see until the project actually bids. And so what we're seeing is the constructability piece is really helping us making sure these projects are on budget and on time, as well as being able to have a contractor that can go out into the community and tell local and minority businesses uh, basically what's coming up next and breaking out packages fit for those who uh, may uh, need you know, work in the community, so. And it seems like we're seeing that work with the projects that we've used this for in the past. Yes, and in most of the projects that are coming with the bond, we've committed to at least a 25% uh, minority participation on those projects. Really wonderful. I feel, I appreciate um, hearing the things that the board has prioritized, and then you kind of tell it back to us and how you're actualizing that. So it's really important. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from board members? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, no. Miss. No. Um, Okay, oh. Ms. Byer. Um, I'm excited about this project moving. I'm excited um, to recognize the members of the selection committee that are here, and we don't recognize our team nearly enough, but uh, you, Mr. Davis, uh, Wilma Jordan, Calvin Stevens, Rudolph Cardenas, Kimberly Williams, Michael McCoy, and Stephen Harris, and I also wanted to give you a chance to talk about the ways that you have included the DSA community in the thinking, dreaming about what will be in this school, because I've seen so many reports on social media about all the educators and folks that have been included in that process so far. And I think it's it's so representative of the Durham community and, and how we do business here in Durham that I just wanted to give you a minute to speak to that, if you don't mind. Yes, yeah, so the initial uh, meeting we brought stakeholders from the community, uh, both on the environmental, public, private side, those who dealt with a school curriculum as well as within the arts. Uh, we had two of those meetings to brainstorm and look at a 50,000 foot approach. We then uh, reduced that core group uh, to those who were really influential in the, the design and building process. And we continue that subcommittee um, at least bi-weekly with the design team to make sure that we have captured all the goals and the program needs of this new state of the art uh, Durham Public Schools of the Arts building. Uh, we will bring forth opportunities uh, later on in the iterations of design. Right now we're in design development. We do plan on having another town hall so they can see uh, the community, what it is that we're doing and provide us feedback so we can, can constantly refine and uh, so that once we get to construction documents, uh, all uh, parties have been heard in this true collaborative design process. Ms. Bagadaris. Thank you so much for this presentation. I mean, we're moving along, right? Step by step, um, piece by piece, and this is a very important piece. Um, I just wanna also commend you for uh, emails going back a couple of, you know, last year we were talking about the Ellery Creek watershed being there and just having uh, opportunity to consult with them about ways to integrate, you know, um, this building of the new school along the, El the Ellerbee Creek watershed. Um, there's uh, trails that we talked about, there's pedestrian, biking, so many different amenities, um, but also just stormwater. Like, so, th so there's like the amenities that our students will enjoy, but also just even some of the considerations for uh, stormwater, like drainage, like so many different pieces of that. And just to always keep in mind, um, you know, having conversations with ECWA and, and any other constituents along the lines of how can we can continue to inform, you know, anybody who works with us so they know that, you know, DPS is definitely committed um, to just sound building, um, as I know these, these vetted uh, consultants are, but also just some considerations with stakeholders as well. Thank you. Thank you. So just a reminder, because I know we, we have emails going back, you know, some time back and, and, and you were definitely... Um, and Dr. Monk as well, thank you so much also for engaging in those conversations. But I guess just picking that up, like always keeping that in, in view. 
Thank you. Any other discussion? Real to offer a motion for our staff to enter in construction management risk contract negotiations for pre-construction services with Monteith Construction and Balfour Beatty in association with Wright Bill International for the new Durham School of the Arts. It's my alma mater. I'm very excited. <laughs> Second. It's been moved by Ms. Rogers, seconded by Ms. Byers. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, please use the same sign. It passes unanimously. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. The next item on our agenda is our strategic plan. I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Hardy. Good evening, Chair Umstead, Dr. Mabinga, board members, our community. We can pull up our presentation. It always gives me great excitement when we have the opportunity to talk about our strategic plan. Um, this time we are actually talking about strategic plan 2023 and beyond. And so we have um, our consultants here with us. So really excited to take this opportunity to spend some time with the board regarding where we are. I do want to take a little bit of an opportunity to talk about the partnership and collaboration that we've had with RTI, as well as our consultant who's been working with us. Research Triangle Institute RTI International is an independent nonprofit research institute dedicated to improving the human condition. The RTI Center for Education Services partners with educators to promote thriving learning environments that facilitate success for all students. Within this center, the Strategic Consulting Group partners with districts and other education agencies to design customized, actionable, and sustainable solutions to improve organizational operations at all levels. Dr. McKenzie, who is here with us, and Kyle Canute. Kyle is not with us. He has a new baby, a new future DPS student. And so know that that is why Kyle is not with us. Um, but Dr. McKenzie brings over 20 years of experience in education and leadership development to his work as a leadership coach and education consultant at RTI International. Dedicated to community engagement, positive school culture, and innovative instructional practices that prepare all children for success. Dr. McKenzie maintains an avid passion and deep commitment to educational equity and access. He has substantial experience as a practitioner, having served as a teacher, a school and district level administrator, and a state level education consultant for innovative schools. He's been a great partner, and it's my pleasure at this time to turn our presentation over to Dr. McKenzie. Thank you, Dr. Hardy. Chair Umstead. Board members, Dr. Mubanga, thank you. And it is indeed an honor to be with you this evening. If you could advance the slide. And in our time together, it is my intent to review the development of our work and present the final draft of the 2023-28 DPS strategic plan. Advance. And I will note that um, our strategic consulting plan has supported several school districts with creating or refreshing their strategic planning process. Um, we've worked with multiple districts in the state of North Carolina, as well as supporting um, districts in neighboring states. If you could advance again. And one more, more time. Thank you. On behalf of Cal Canyon and the staff at RTI, it has indeed been a great experience working in partnership with the fine community of Durham to construct this strategic plan. Next slide. Over the past eight months, we have worked with the steering committee who uplifted um, the voice of the community to guide this work and ensure that the final product reflected the needs and values of Durham. Alongside this work, we considered a robust approach to engaging the community by leveraging community champions, soliciting authentic responses, and reducing barriers to increase accessibility to hear the various perspectives of the community. 
Throughout our work, we made a conscious effort to keep the community informed. Next slide. Quickly, this is a highlight of the engagement of the community, the senior staff of the district, and you, the board, board over time as illustrated in this overview of the process. Next slide. In our initial meeting, you shared that this plan should be community driven. Next slide. Here you see participation from the questionnaire we launched in September and efforts to gain thoughts and feedback from the community. We had nearly 1,000 respondents. In addition, we conducted a total of 17 focus groups, both virtually and face-to-face, -to, -face, to gain the perspective of the district staff, principals, teachers, next slide, teachers and students, as well as families from various communities throughout the district. Now, as we approach the final stages, we followed up in the spring with town halls to gain feedback on the draft plan. Next slide. The board also pointed out in the initial meeting the importance of working to ensure that the plan reflects the will of our diverse community. During the early stages of collecting data, we noted that it was not representative of the Durham Public School community. And in this moment, we extended the window for the questionnaire beyond the new year, 2023. And thanks to the support from district personnel, particularly in communications and community engagement, we strategically did the following. We solicited targeted outreach with principals to engage our underrepresented communities. We partnered with the Ministerial Alliance to share with congregations across Durham about these events. We worked with the Durham Public School Multilingual Resource Center to more effectively engage the Latinx community. We identified how we could think beyond traditional engagement strategies to leverage grassroots relationship-based engagement through town halls. Next slide. Finally, we are appreciative of the steering committee who worked extensively to analyze the data and draw implications for what the strategic plan should look like in order to capture the voice of the community. The committee consisted of 60 plus members representing business, industry, family, religious and civic organizations, and diverse positions in education at all levels. More importantly, our students had a valued voice at the table. Next slide. In sharing the strategic plan with the community, we took the time to explain what it is and what it is not in using this, next slide, in using this particular visual. Ver, um, visual. We drew this parallel. There are high level priorities and goals that identify the district's biggest challenges. And at the ground level, there are multiple vehicles via initiatives, programs, and actions to get us to our ultimate destination. And along this journey, there will be multiple mile markers and rest stops. In other words, benchmarks, <laughs> so we can gauge how we are doing. Next slide. Without further delay, we are excited <laughs> to present to the board the 2023-28 strategic plan. Next slide. The strategic plan is moving forward with new and ambitious goals inspired by our current plan. We recognize that the current plan propelled us forward in the right direction to support our students and do what was best for our students. There is value in continuity. We agree 
that these priorities and goals are important to the community of Durham Public Schools. We also admit that the pandemic exposed some things and has pushed us to move with a sense of urgency to address specific areas of concern. Our plan continues to be committed to the core values to the district with a focus on equity, response, shared responsibility, and our children. Next slide. Now, when we dive into the strategic plan, we immediately focus on subgroup performance and addressing opportunity gaps. Priority one, and we've heard you loudly and clearly, fostering academic excellence. Here, there is a specific focus in setting quantifying targets for identified subgroups and how we support teachers in supporting all students to achieve academically. Advance, priority two, providing a safe and healthy school environment. Now, how do we strengthen vital social and emotional supports to address mental health and wellness for both students and adults? Once again, we want to quantify these efforts by subgroup as it relates to exclusionary practices, student attendance, and student voice, just to name a few, so that students achieve academically and do well socially. Next, priority three, recruiting, supporting, and retaining our staff. Now, not only did we find it important to attract high quality teachers, but also supporting them through effective professional and leadership development. In this priority, we are intentional in filling positions that are hard to staff and ensuring that these positions represent the demographics of our community. Next, priority four, cultivate meaningful and authentic community engagement. Now, while it may be tough to measure, we acknowledge the importance of listening to and partnering with our community and responding accordingly to their needs. It truly takes a village and therefore you have the strategies and measures that are recommended. Next, priority five, conducting the work of, of Durham Public Schools responsibly and equitably. Now, under the umbrella of this priority, we aspire to create a system and infrastructure that is appealing to the community and more importantly, an environment that is conducive for providing a quality education for all students. Next slide. Now the true innovation in our final product lies in how we address these priorities and measure our success. Now per the board's request, we have established benchmarks to do just this. And it is my, you receive those um, prior to this meeting or at the beginning of this meeting. And we definitely want to thank um, district leadership for supporting us in that. So as we move forward, advance. So as we move forward, we remain committed to the core beliefs, equity, shared responsibility, high expectations, and a child-centered approach. Next, with this, there is an intentionality in addressing the needs of specific communities. Next, in order to do this, we must collectively as a whole engage in authentic conversations, assess the work and make adjustments accordingly. And next, in this work, we move toward building a higher level of trust and transparency between the school district and the community. So, as the opening passage to the strategic plan states, let's seize the opportunity 
and embark on the next steps in Durham Public Schools evolution. We invite, we invite all members of our community to join us in bringing this vision to fruition. Thank you. And at this time, if there are any questions or comments from the board, we'd love to hear. Chair um, Umstead, this is before the boards tonight for information. We have provided um, to the public, thanks to Ms. Smith, in addition to the presentation that Dr. McKenzie has shared, um, the public can also see the draft um, strategic plan document, know that it is draft and still a, under review and copy edit. So it is, that is posted as well as the draft goals that are before the board tonight. We're open for discussion and feedback and then we'll yield to your direction regarding next steps. Thank you, Dr. Hardy and Dr. McKenzie for this presentation. I do wanna um, also share with board members, um, staff would really like to, and I think it's important that we have a strategic plan that's voted on um, before the end of this school year. And so hopefully in our May work session, we can vote on this so that we know many of our year round schools start in July, that they have a plan and guidelines for where they want to go moving forward. So I think that'd be really important one for us to make sure we consider. I think it is for information tonight. Can we provide feedback that's necessary to make the tweaks so that um, our board and our staff have direction on where we want to go. Um, I'll also just add this one other comment, being a part of this committee, and I remember one of our first meetings, we asked, you know, looked at the focus areas, the priority, priority areas, and we're like, okay, what else do we need to add or take away? And I know at my table, we were just like, well, I don't know. <laughs> like, this feels like the work that, the, that our school district is supposed to do, and so what other um, goals and strategies need to be aligned. So I think that's why you see some of the similarity here from our previous strategic plan, because this this is kind of the work of school system. These priorities are part of our public school work. Um, so just wanted to give those kind of introductory comments to this conversation, but also open the floor for any questions or concerns from people. Ms. Byer. I don't want to belabor and get into specifics, but the the passing this at the work session feels rushed to me, and I just want to kind of name that if, if see if others are feeling that. I was hoping that we would get the detailed feedback both from the sessions that you all recently led and also like the survey data, like to go deep for us to be able to make sure that we were hearing um, community members' concerns, and then the community is just seeing it actually for the first time this week as well. And so I look forward actually to more feedback from our community. So I, I understand the need to pass it before the next calendar year. I knew that Dr. Mavinga would not want to start without June 2020, yeah. He wants version 2.0, I get it. But, uh, but I also want us to have time to get some more engagement um, and, and see that, that feedback because I know our community has a lot to share and, and I, I myself am just looking at these things. I know y'all email them to us, but I'm just like still digging into how we got to there. So I just wanted to kind of start with that. Um, but I'll let y'all jump in there. Thanks. Ms. Travis. All right. Thank you very much. Um, this has been so much work, conversation. Um, it was a pleasure to be at the at the strategic planning meetings, um, strategic plan planning meetings. And um, also thank you um, for uh, working on the benchmarks as well. Um, I know that was a, you know, it's another step to kind of create a path for how we're moving forward. Um, I'm gonna try to just briefly share some thoughts I have um, right now. Um, one, so I think I have five comments right now. One is um, on goal 1B, um, I, I uh, particularly appreciate that you included the subgroup data um, so we can really study that. Um, my request would be that in the actual goal, we add the word proportionately um, such that each subgroup's proficiency will increase proportionately. Um, as measured by end of grade and end of course test, testing. Um, if it's the same proportion of 40, 44% is where we're at now, going to 60, then for black students, for instance, that would be 
um, going to about 47.9% um, proficiency for Hispanic or Latinx students. So it would be going to 46.85%. Uh, so just um, so we can have some goals as far as percentages for our subgroups too, I think would be great. Um, so that it's not uh, just only our students who are already doing well increase, and then that's what gives us our sixty percent. But our, um, our our students of color, our Black and Latinx, um, LEP students with disabilities are not um, are not progressing at the same rate. So I just wanted to ask for that. Um, goal to be um, about discipline. Yeah, please do. So I just want to add this really quickly because what you brought up was the same point I was going to break and I want to bring it back up. And I think the way you broke that down about proportionate is really a good idea. One of the things that I was suggesting is maybe breaking up that goal, taking out where that end is and making it two separate goals so that we can track that proportional, that proportionality that's happening. Um, yeah. If that, because to me, you do that at least 70% of DPS students will achieve grade level proficiency and each group separate. So like that goal is two goals, it feels like. I just wanna quickly uh, softly react. Um, when we're looking at a demographic of our students, 80% are minority. There's no way we're gonna get to 70% just by the 20% or the 19 being able to get us to 70%. I understand we can break it down, but um, mathematically it's not gonna work if we only have 19% or 20% being white and 80% being minority for us to get to 70%. I think I'm um, not disagreeing with what you're saying. And yeah, the goal is 70%. Sorry, I said 60 um, and I calculated wrong. So um, only that the growth would be proportionate for um, students of color um, or for, for subgroups, I should say it's not only Black and um, Latinx students, but other subgroups that are doing uh, disproportionately um, worse right now academically. So not that every subgroup would reach 70%. I don't think that's necessarily realistic, um, but that there would be proportionate growth. Does that make more sense? Yes, it makes sense. Um, when I'm looking at theoretically, when you're writing goals, it needs to be at a broad perspective. I think what I'm hearing more, we're getting to objectives. We're getting more to objectives. So, but uh, I'll be fine. Uh, I'm used to having goals really to be broad, then objective being really the one, the next level. But uh, if uh, you feel like, uh, then I would agree that we have to write a different goal if that's the case. Otherwise, if we start breaking it down, that becomes more objective than the goal to me. Yeah, I think, um, I I guess I'll just say, uh, yeah, I'm fine with be, it being a different goal and I can see why it would be. And um, it just, but um, some kind of way, I think um, some of us really wanna see this um, emphasize the growth for our uh, marginalized students basically. And so, um, however we get there and, um, you know, make sure we're achieving incrementally along those lines. Um, with goal to be, I had a similar comment and I was thinking about using the word proportionately, um, but I'm actually, I don't know, maybe other folks have comments about that too, um, because I don't know, I'm still concerned that, you know, 10.55% um, of our um, black students are experiencing suspension. Um, so I'd like to see that proportionately even lower <laughs> than, um, than the, the 6.25, um, you know, to five, moving to 5% for, for black students, that would be going from 10.55 to 8.44%, which to me is still high. So, um, I'm just gonna leave that there, but that's, a. Uh, um, uh, Maybe I'll have more constructive feedback on that, um, but just wanted to raise that point. Um, 2D, um, let's see, I was, 
wondering if we might have a goal or why and I, forgive me if uh, we've gone over this. I don't remember what, exactly why this goal, um, rather than, uh, for instance, so like similar to the one ar around um, staff uh, working condition survey, um, that 95% or whatever percent of students will say they have um, a positive experience or something like that. Um, not just the completion of the student survey, uh, which is one level of engagement, you know, for them to part, to um, give that feedback. But can we have something about um, their sense of um, belonging or sense of um, whatever it is, well-being in the school, um, since, since this is about SEL? Um, okay, goal 3C. I've said this, I, um, I think, uh, I don't know if we're still... I'm hoping we're still going to make an emphasis here for goal 3C on black male educators, because that's where we are um, lacking. Our, um, our black teacher population mirrors the black student population overall. Um, and however, our black male popula teacher population is what is um, significantly lacking. So I'd still love to see that in there. And the last thing, um, five five A. I just wanted to ask what our goal or what our definition of environmentally conscious is. Um, so just reminding that the board that the board has already passed a resolution for where we we're going to be energy wise um, by twenty thirty. I think it is. Um, my memory serves me correctly. Um, some of the things that you would do with um, environmentally conscious would obviously solar panels, um, which we've already embarked on. We're going to have a solar celebration at Lions uh, Farm here soon. Uh, next steps will also be to um, discuss water reclamation on some of our sites. Um, we've discussed uh, composting on um, on our site. So anything that is um, going to help our environment. Uh, be better for not only uh, obviously what we're doing at our schools, but in our community and the world. Um, that's how we're going to um, address it in operations. And then all of the things that Mr. Davis is doing with the building uh, construction projects and our standards and our learning environment guidelines are all centered around how do we build uh, well buildings and um, higher energy and performance uh, type buildings. Thank you. So, uh, and um, is there, do we have just even more specifically, like, a, is there a stand, a minimum standard that a school has to reach or a building has to reach to be environmentally conscious? Because I realize there are a lot of different ways. Not all of our schools are going to have solar panels, at least right now. But, um, or are we kind of leaving that broad so that a, it could be dependent on the building and what's accessible to them and what's possible? That's right. It's okay. it's more of applying that environmental lens to the um, to the built environment. Miss um, Vagadaris. Thank you so much for bringing this to us. Um, and I thank you for also, you know, taking time to meet with us um, as board members. We had um, the opportunity to hear this, but um, I think I'll echo what my colleagues say. This, this, you know, there's a lot that we're processing about this. It is a strategic plan that is going to carry out, and we want to be really intentional. And so, I think we have really good pieces and really good things. Um, and it does follow the 2018 strategic plan, the, the format in terms of like the priorities. And I'm, I, I understand also, you know, how important it is to kind of like hone in on the goals that we have, and then also just really have concrete strategies and um and i do see some strategies but um i have some feedback in conversations and i think um all the students who came today i think our students spoke so clearly about mental health supports and trauma um we always talk about being a, being a trauma-informed district and um we strive to do that and yet sometimes you know this is the opportunity actually where we can actually just co uh, codify 
make sure that it's really, really clear how, you know, how we're approaching trauma, trauma-informed district, and also just the supports, overall supports for the community. And so um, some suggestions, and I, and I want to thank also Megan Gonzalez-Smith, um, DPS Foundation. I know that we, as a, as a Board of Education, um, do support the whole, child's, whole um, child initiative, the wellness initiative for mental health. And, you know, we put $280,000 forth towards that. But the school district itself has an opportunity with this strategic plan to do something in terms of creating the kinds of connection, sense of belonging. And um, I will say, you know, sense of belonging doesn't come easy for everybody. That is the biggest struggle um, when I talk to, to families and it's something that I know personally, right? And, you know, we have, adults have conversations, difficult conversations about, you know, what does it mean to belong? What does it mean to, you know, for everybody to work together, to kind of work across difference? What does it mean to um, feel like a sense of ownership that we all, you know, belong in the space? And those conversations are also happening in the schools, you know, with our students, um, the diversity that we have. I, I can tell you that there's a need for it and I see it in terms of training and professional development training that needs to happen. And so I'm gonna just walk through um, some of the suggestions here. So when it comes to, to the goals um, and the strategies, I'm, I'm gonna start with, actually I'm gonna start with the strategies and just go back to the goal. But um, again, th I, think, uh, I think all the folks who've reached out and in this case, um, I know that DPS Foundation is also a partner with mental health supports and, and especially with priority two. Um, some of the strategies that are that are listed in here, um, it's it's about changing. So when we're talking about restorative practices, I always go back to it's a practice. It's practice based, um, and trainings provide an opportunity for practice based. So um, to be able to start that by saying that you know all administrators and educators um, will receive annual professional development, professional learning and supports. So all school administrators and educators receive annual professional learning and supports for, and then everything that you wrote on there. Um, it just really does say how we're gonna do this. Um, it's through training, it's through implicit bias training. Today, we had a meeting with Director Eva Howard. Um, and, you know, it was so wonderful to kind of see how even our director who was in charge of like working with Dr. Monk and working with with um, with our team is, is very aware of, of like a need and, you know, definitely supported, you know, the, the conversation around implicit bias. Um, but there's so much more training that needs to happen. So for that particular strategy, um, I, I definitely align with um, with some of the conversations that are happening also with some of our team. Also student voice, um, when it comes to the surveys and having students have, um, you know, 95% of the students completing the surveys, uh, that's for the student voice. You know, this is this is this is one of those things where also, you know, there, there's there's something important about annual training to make meaning of that data. Because one thing is we can have all the numbers and the numbers will tell us and the numbers have been telling us for a long time, but you know, how are, how, how are schools going, going to be equipped to deal with that data, especially uncomfortable data? Adults have uncomfortable conversations, we have them. Um, administrators are, are having uncomfortable conversations, but what to do with that? So I think just something along those lines as well. And then the other thing, um, is when it comes to, you know, um, wellness and implementation. So th there's there's definitely more things in terms of, um, you know, adding a strategy that is not currently on there. And it's about setting up teams that are going to make sure that this is kind of like we set up committees and teams, teams that are going to continue to look at wellness, um, look at sense of belonging, um, dedicate some time. Um, so many schools have circle time in the beginning and, and they start the day with circle time and there are many different practices and we have SEL curriculum, but just like a team that is actually um, having the conversations about the, the current wellness in a school, how, how palpable is it? Um, and so that's a strategy that um, kind of brings a little bit of having a committee. And, and so these are conversations, as I mentioned, um, that are happening even after we met. <laughs> um, but going back to the priorities, um, I agree with with uh, my colleague Emily Chavez when you mentioned 2D. I was, you know, th this is definitely something that um, resonates when it comes to having a goal that will center connection um, versus a goal that talks about the surveys just being 95% participation. Um, I think that the 95% participation will go into under the student voice, right? That's just how do we know that student voices are being 
seen it's it's the survey the 95 so this piece i would say that 2d can just be moved to again um my my colleagues and also uh, weigh in but that particular piece would be great for the student voice because that actually puts the data that we got 95 percent of our students participating in this but i will say that um for 2d I, i'd love to see something along the lines of, of just connection how connected do our kids feel we saw data um, talking about our middle school kids, it broke my heart. Um, I really, I really place myself as you know, and I and I and I and I look at my children. I look at so many of my children's friends and the students that I talk to about how hard middle school is. It, it's it's, and we know research shows that that is such a, a very important developmental stage. Um, what I'd like to see um, is definitely something along the lines of like how um, for for by 2028, this percentage of students will say that they are connected to their schools. That'll help us with truancy. You know, we have uh, truancy issues in high school um, and, and even in, in middle school um, truancy, we have uh, disengaged, disenfranchised youth. Um, I'd love to see just because we're working on the middle school, we're looking at all our data and we're seeing that in middle school, it seems like um, even in the student climate surveys, it does show that sense of belonging, you know, declines in middle school for a reason. So I'd, I'd love 2D to kind of have more about this percentage of students will feel connected to their schools. And then of course we have the student voice strategy, which will tell us that, you know, they did the survey. Um, and I think also our student support services department that has panorama student data, um, that'll continue to help us along those lines. But those are some thoughts. And again, I think um, everybody who's reached out, I mean, we are here to listen to any constituents of, you know, as we hear more, you, you, you may get, you know, the emails. Um, and I'm pretty sure that, uh, you know, our partners at, DPS Foundation will be sending an email with their thoughts, but also um, just community members and administrators um, as well. Like we, we just want to be able to give you that feedback and, and let you know that it's here. We just maybe small changes. And um, I'm also looking to my other colleagues to see any other thoughts about that. Thank you. Kim Swagdar. Ms. Carter Alton. Thank you so much. Great to see this. Um, it's also good to see that um, my thoughts align with uh, my colleagues. I sent um, these already to Dr. Hardy, and who I think passed them on to you, but I'll just share, but I don't see them reflected in the current version, so I'll share them again. Um, so similarly, while I see uh, English language learners, EC students, Black and Hispanic students, um, in the strategies, I don't see it reflected in the goals that we're measuring. And um, I think uh, the, the idea to make this pro something pro about proportionate makes sense maybe, but you know, in my mind, I just want it to be at minimum a quantifiable target for our subgroups um, that are struggling um, rather than that just saying that we want any increase. And I, and I understand that um, the desire to remain broad in some ways, but <clears throat> I mean, at the, as currently written, uh, we're basically saying we'd be okay with only 18% of English language learners or EC students achieving proficiency. And I don't think that that's what, um, what any of us want. I think we wanna be reaching for something ideally proportionate um, to what everyone is achieving. Um, I think similarly, it would be great if um, 1C also were broken out by subgroup. <clears throat> um, again, if we look at our graduation rates, um, our total graduation rate isn't too far from our target. But if you look at it broken out by subgroup, um, we have groups that are struggling. And I think, Again, if we have a metric that we're working towards for each of our subgroups that are struggling, that means um, ideally we'll be working harder to get everybody where they need to be um, when it comes to both proficiency and um, graduation rates. Um, also, I'd love, I know that at this point, we probably don't wanna add um, entire goals, but in my dream world, <laughs> We have another goal under priority one that specifically sets a target for um, related to English language learners, um, maybe achieving English language proficiency or something that again shows that we're dedicating our resources um, and our time towards that uh, 
group. <clears throat> um, also, let's see, as others have noted, um, for 2B, um, I'd love to see um, us look at a metric for a decrease in suspensions by subgroups um, that disproportionately experience exclusionary discipline. Also similarly, so for 2D, again, um, it really feels like, as others have noted, that we um, that mental health support is missing from the goals and metrics um, and two. So I, I was thinking, um, I, I really like the suggestions that have been made already. I had been thinking maybe have, um, again, not just the percent that have completed the survey, but um, student responses related to whether they feel um, that their mental and emotional needs are being supported by DPS. Um, but connectedness is also great. Something I, I think to get at this um, mental and emotional well-being and to track that not just the process outcome of whether or not folks are participating, but the actual like whether we're making progress and meeting our students' needs. Um, that's the the only other one, and again, there's more that I shared with y'all, but um, the only other one that I'll note is, and I think you alluded to this in your presentation, but um, 4A and 4B seem significantly less measurable. And I think that's by by nature of, of what we're trying to do there, but, I guess I'm curious to know how we're going to know if we're successful in achieving these goals, if they, like as they're currently written, it just feels very fuzzy to me. And um, I thought that that might be worth discussing a little bit more. And I think that's the bulk of my feedback. So thank you again for taking note and thanks. Cicillus. Thank you for this presentation and all the hard work that the community has come together, um, who's been a part of the TAP, the um, strategic planning for the 2023 and beyond. Um, I wonder if goal 1C should be 100%, 95%, maybe. Um, I'm sure you have your reason there, and I know you have the benchmarks as well. That was just, um, i just like to see everybody graduating. Most of my comments come from priority two. I sent you a comment about fidelity and goal 2A. You can strike that because you actually have it. That is the goal <laughs> to create a, fidel a system of fidelity, uh, measuring fidelity. I thought that was really good. I just didn't read it well. I just went straight to the 2022, 2028. Goal 2B. I know that we are always focusing on our student suspension. I wonder if we could shift our focus to our restorative practices in that space. If we're, we don't want, we want to lower suspension rates, but we don't want to feel like that some behaviors are being overlooked because we don't want to increase the suspension rates that show up on our school reports or under, you know, things of that nature. What if, again, the solution is more about restorative practice and recidivism from those who are receiving restorative practices? Goal 2C, I think that this goal is um, a bit of out of our control. It's really whether the student sh shows up or not. <laughs> um, I wonder if we could have a goal more along our, our, within our standards that relate to, we will implement, DPS will implement student support service for any student with three or more absences, what we will do once the absences are beginning to occur. So just giving that a different perspective. I agree with everything that my colleagues have said about 2D. I ask like, instead of just that they're completing it, but are they feeling engaged? I would shy away from that they feel like their mental health needs are supported because we're really in their teaching and mental health is like, you know, we need that with nourishment and food, but like really want them to feel engaged and belong. If that would be the tracking for, for doing these satisfaction survey, not so, well, is it satisfaction? Yeah, student surveys. And then um, I gave a little bit of focus on priority four. I think the main thing here for me um, was the 4C, the very last sentence, um, increasing positive student outcomes. And I was just like, as evidence of what? Similar like to the engagement. What is it that's showing us that level of um, what what is a positive student outcome like? What is what is a metric that's being as evidence of what in that metric? Um, 
but it, this this feels like it is um, strategic plan 2.0. This is this is what we do, right? We educate kids. We want to foster a sense of self and belonging and academic achievement, achievement and greatness. So I think it will sound some of the same, but I also see a lot of um, pushing ourselves to getting to greater results for our kids. Um, I, I appreciate Dr. Hardy, you getting these metrics to us um, that we can dive into. Um, we, this is truly doing the work by our students, staff, faculty, um, to get what our what our schools need, um, getting all of our children igniting that spark. So thank you for this. Thank you for your leadership in it. Thank you for just the details and, and taking this feedback. I don't I hope it doesn't feel like it's a overhaul, a big start over. <laughs> It's just my perspective. I, I try to come from a, a positive wellness approach in it. So again, what are we doing to capture how we can do our restorative practices and reduce recidivism? Thank you. Ms. Rogers. Thank you so much for this presentation and this work. It's been a pleasure to serve as part of um, the steering committee, strategic plan steering committee and to be in spaces with our community where they're sharing what they think our priorities should be. Um, that's very important to me. Piggybacking off what Ms. Lewis said in regards to increasing positive student outcomes, I think um, naming and listing a positive student outcome would be that attendance will increase, right? Um, we will see better proficiency and those such things. And so as I read through these, that was what I came in feeling like we needed to be more attentive to what the student outcomes were. And then we had a relatively emotional start to our meeting. And I understood the social emotional need of addressing the concerns that Ms. Valadar is and um, Ms. Carter Otten highlighted in priorities to, in priority to with those um, goals. My question, I think, is mostly around priority three. Uh, we talk about student outcomes. We talk about increasing the retention rate of DPS employees with a focus on teachers and instructional assistants and bus drivers. We are asking our principals and administrators to be everything to everybody. And I'm not sure that we have been attentive to their needs in this space. And I wonder if there's somewhere between priority two and priority three, where we are making sure that the principals have the training and support that they need and measuring that training and support to be trauma-informed, to use the data, that they're collecting in the student surveys to have an impact on what's actually happening in school buildings. Um, we expect them to be at board meetings presenting their student of the month. We expect them at basketball games and we expect them at the spelling bee on the weekends. And so what does it mean to for a principal to have a team that's able to help with that and how can we measure that here? Um, I also want to see us measuring and making sure that we are getting some exit data from folks that are leaving DPS. Because I don't see that in the recruit, support, and retain. And I know it doesn't seem like um, it's that important, but it really is important in talking about why people are leaving in order to change what's actually happening in our buildings. And I've been hung up on I'm Board Member Rogers. Thank you. Just to clarify, and I'm trying to toggle back and forth because I do not have all of our goals, benchmarks, and strategies memorized. There, mm -hmm. there is a strategy in priority four. Um, it says conduct and analyze exit and stay interviews to identify and address employee needs and areas of growth for the district um, and its schools. In reference to your most recent comment, do you are you kind of getting us to that needs more attention, or I do think you it think needs more to be quantifiable. 
Okay. Right. Like we're going to get 80% of staff to fill out this exit or to have an exit interview because a conversation sometimes can be very different than a survey. I don't know if we have capacity to do that, but yeah, 80% is high, but it might be what it takes to get people to stay, to understand what we need to change because we have to hear that. And sometimes we have to hear things seven times before it sticks with us. Um, thank you. <laughs> and I've been a real stickler about 5B. 90% of DPS students who ride district buses will have on-time arrival to and from schools. What percent are we at right now? Um, so right now we are, well, for the 2021-22 school year, we were at 82%. Okay. That's helpful. Do parents typically know that? And educators? So it's, it's not something that you would typically, you go to many places, that's not something that you're going to see. Like, it's not a KPI that you would normally measure, measure mm -hmm. right? Um, while we've included it, it, it as, a, as a matter of fact, it wasn't in the initial strategic plan. We were talking about things like how we calculate efficiency based off of how many people we put on a bus and how many miles we drive a day which is how DPI basically pays us. Mm -hmm. um, my team, Mr. Palmer, Mr. Harris, felt it was um, very important, um, especially from the phone calls that we had received from parents um, and from uh, many of the board members to recognize the importance of not, how, also, not only how many routes are we making each day, how many people we're putting on a bus, but are they getting to school on time? Because when they get to school on time, their instruction time is the time that it needs to be, which is going to feed into all those other priorities that we have listed above five. And so that's why we felt it was important that we include this type of key performance indicator in how we do our everyday work. I think it's important. I agree with you. I am very appreciative that you reduced it from 100% to 90. Um, I think that we can make it to 90. If we make it to 100, that'd be great also. Um, we have to work on how we're using that because we need to market that and let people know, get on the bus, 82% of the time students will arrive on time. We have some educators who are struggling when we talk about truancy rates with students arriving tardy because they're not getting on the buses. And so um, thank you. That's all I got. Ms. Barr. Thank you all. I wanted to thank especially um, Ms. Hempstead and Ms. Chavez and Ms. Rogers for serving on this community, um, but also all the community members that joined in this work, that some that are staff and some that are our, our brilliant, thoughtful, equity-driven um, community members. Um, we owe you deep gratitude. Um, a lot of my colleagues have have talked about the things that that I wanted to cover, and I don't want to belabor anyone's time, but I do see I do want to reiterate why I think we still need a little more time because we're still <laughs> trying to make it more aspirational, and also with stretch goals, Dr. Mbinga, that you and your team help set the actual data. I mean, I don't I don't think it is any of our intention to pick numbers, y'all pick those, but but I do hear us, lots of us consistently saying some reflection of subgroups actually explicitly spelled out, um, I think is, would be incredible to include. I'd even dream, and this is just me trying to get version 2.0 to actually reflect that we've just come through our pandemic and our students and our staff are not okay. I'd like us to consider swapping goals, priorities one and two. Like I'd like us to actually have provide a safe and healthy school environment that supports the whole child and staff, lead the whole thing, lead the work. Because to me, if we're doing that right, then the data follows. It doesn't, I, and so I, you know, I may be just one voice thinking that, but I just really think we get that part right, and then the other part comes behind. Um, 
again, I think of some measurable thing. It's it's currently, I, I think 2D is kind of a weak goal as written um, that we're going to have students take surveys um, or 95% participation. So is there a, a data point in para, panorama? Pana, panorama. <laughs> is there something there that we could use, something measurable there that actually gets at the qualitative sense of belonging that others have talked about. I agree on the Latino educators and black male educators is what we really want to focus on. And I don't know whether the staff component should be included in that goal or not, but I leave it to y'all to kind of wrestle with some of these things that we're bringing up for, as suggestions. I talked in our session about explicitly stating as a goal that we we want an exceptional principal leading every DPS school. And um, I think that would be powerful. I don't know how that's defined. And so, but I think, you know, it's when you know it, you know it, when you have it, you have it. Um, I, I wonder about something specifically in um, about language justice and and the need for interpretation and actually meeting that need. I think about maybe in priority four, adding a goal there that says something explicit about the interpretation needs of our communities and families will be met there because if they don't have interpretation, they can't be authentically engaged. And we saw that so much um, at the event last Friday night. Um, and I appreciate our families and um, stakeholders for joining us and calling us and holding us accountable. Um, I, I wonder about language somewhere in, in a stated goal about equity and intersectionality. And I don't know if it's there, but I want it to be explicitly there. We're having our workshop tomorrow about LGBTQ training. Like, I, I think we've got growth to do. And if we want it there, I think we need to be explicit about that, just the way we're being explicit about some of our subgroups. Um, I wonder about, along with sustainability goals that we've kind of put in there, and Dr. Monk, you talked about some of those, do we want to talk about outdoor education and actually getting kids moving and um, all the things that lead to brain health? Again, I I said it last time on this version of this plan, it didn't get in there, but early childhood education, like our city, county, just like we did tonight with this resolution, a joint resolution, we passed one in, I think, 2015 with a commitment to grow and expand universal pre-K in Durham. We were going to do it, not wait on the state. COVID kind of derailed us for a while. And so I think if we want to do it and hold ourselves accountable, we got to state it as a goal, not bury it in a strategy. Um, so early literacy, and I don't see a literacy goal, and I wonder if we need one in the academic um, priority one. Like it, if it's such an important goal of reading by third grade or whatever, and I know the state does bad literacy initiatives, but I mean, is there a good literacy goal that we should consider um, adding? So I really appreciate y'all helping us continue to refine it. I think it's getting better and better every time we come up with ideas. And I and I very much support subgroups broken out in ways that will continue to hold us to stretching and stretching and stretching. I, I wonder about a specific explicit goal for EC students. And, and Patina, you and I may have been the only ones here when we said at one of our board retreats over the summer, we are going to focus on meeting needs of our students with exceptional needs. And we didn't do it like we wanted to and we didn't. And so I wonder, do we actually state it? And especially because we know coming out of the pandemic, that is one of our most vulnerable um, subgroups. So I look forward to, to ways that y'all let it help us continue to stretch and stretch and stretch. Thank you. I'm gonna go to Ms. Chavez and then I'll come back to you, Ms. Sayadaris. Um, okay, so now I have a few more points. Um, <laughs> so um, I wanted to come back to to be because I thought more about what my thing about this is. I think my issue is that is the fact that 
black students are seven over seven times more likely to get suspended than white students. Can the goal be about um and and um you know I also heard what you said, Ms. Lewis, about the restorative practices, just making that a focus, period. But if we keep something along these lines, um uh reducing that disparity is important to me more than just proportionately black and uh black students and hispanic students like you know less less uh suspensions for those populations of students but um it's the the seven times is just um it's like unacceptable to me and um national problem but um you know can we address that disparity in this um so um, that's that. I want to comment on a few other things. Going back to 3C, I think Ms. Byer just said this, but um, I also want to scrap the, the part that says, and staff. Focus on teachers, focus on educators, certified, certified or certified teacher or certified staff, rather, um, so that we make sure that we're getting more, um, more teachers, more of those, um, or counselors, um, but certified uh, professional staff um, who are um, Latinx um, or black male um, educators. Um, I like the point about leadership that my colleagues mentioned, um, or, you know, so do what you will with that. But I did like the point about, you know, just supporting our principals or having, a, a, you know, a strong leader in every building we have. Um, that's it's just uh, very it's an important part of our of our whole landscape here so um maybe something about um supporting our leadership and the the sort of work that um dr stewart was has been doing this year with um uh you know school improvement plan or uh, teams and um supporting our principals kind of lends itself to that um for a i think this is getting at just having good communication, um, I think. And so maybe something even a little bit more clear about just having good um, solid communication in every aspect of our um, of our uh, practice is uh, would be good here. Um, and I wanted to also say a couple things. Um, I wanted to disagree about um, a couple things. The exit interviews, I think they're important, but I don't know that they ra raise to the stand should be a goal. But I did want to say, I imagine that with each of these strategies, then there are goals around them created within departments. Is that correct? So ultimately, the strategies start to become part of the department improvement plan. So when you think about Dr. Mabinga's non-negotiables, we have school level non-negotiables as well as central service non-negotiables. And those central service non-negotiables really yield, lean into the strategic plan and how departments then are operationalizing their work as we support schools. And then that's a part of their department improvement plan that they are working towards in addition to the work um, that they're doing with the strategic plan. And also, even if it is not explicitly measured, there has been the culture here in Durham that we have reported transparently on all of the data points. So know that that is not something I would imagine that our board and our community would see shifting with the strategic plan. So if we're talking about staffing and our demographics regarding our staffing or student data um, or student discipline data, we have always reported those data very explicitly by subgroup as well as by gender. Um, and then have had, if we needed to, additional conversations if we were at a point where we were not able to report that publicly because of the, the smaller size to make sure that our board understands um, our progress or potentially our, our lack of progress, if that is the case with a particular subgroup. But we've tried to make sure that we are um, very transparent in sharing the, the data points um, with our board and our community. Thank you for explaining that, Dr. Hardy. I think that's um, just important for people to understand that with 
even though we have our main points for the strategic plan, that doesn't take away from the other um, goals that departments then have and um, people are responsible for. So I want to say that. Um, and then also um, what you were saying, Ms. Byer, I was, I have at the meetings I kept, I mean, I feel like one of my main things was that priority two feeds priority one <laughs> and it's, um, they're integrated so well um, or they're, um, they can't be pulled apart um, entirely. But I do think we should keep priority one um, what it is so that there's a, still a focus on academics um, overall, even though I completely agree that um, that you can't have, you know, can't meet academics without attending to the mental health of students. So I just wanted to say that, um, was there anything else? Oh, and that um, I just wanted to point out the piece about intersectionality. There is mention of that. Yeah, so, okay which I, I like that that's in there. So, okay, thanks. Ms. Valladares. Yes, um, I was thinking about uh, the placement of this one. I think it might be five and Dr. Monk, you, you can tell me and Dr. Hardy as well. Um, so looking at the CDC's model, like they have a whole school, whole community, whole child model. Um, they have a list of priorities. So physical education, physical activity is number one. Number two is nutrition, environment, and services. When it comes to nutrition, I know these are conversations, um, emails, you know, I'm so grateful for the DINE program and they sent us a report of what DINE is doing, but they're serving elementary and middle school kids. And I want to see them expand. And they're already there's good news because the NC Cooperative Extension has been also building capacity to support. But the truancy that is happening, I can attest, you know, my goodness, cafeteria lunches are not popular. And we have to do a lot of work in terms of like, how to incentivize our kids staying in the school building, staying in the school building. Oh my gosh. That is, I think so many parents out there, like, you know, you tell your child, you know, this is the safest place. There's food in the cafeteria. There's some schools that already have, you know, not all the schools, but if they have, you know, that, uh, title one, um, not title one funds, but if, if they're a school that has the proportion of snap, uh, eligible families, you know, that entire school gets lunch is accessible. And yet, I've talked to many community members. I've, I've surveyed folks from that are food insecure. And I, I asked them, are your kids eating the cafeteria foods? And they're telling me, no. I'm actually so surprised that there isn't more movement along incentivizing um, either improving our, our, our food options. And I know that we had the farmer, um, the, 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 yeah, the Governor Cooper came in and the farm bill, right? Um, what was it called again? It was uh, Governor Cooper came in and talked about the farm to table kind of options, you know, where we brought in like, you know, fresh produce because the freshness of the food is definitely something. And, and I know kids have balked at canned kind of things. And so there's many different ways I'd love for us to include in either priority five where there's operational things along the lines of nutrition, cafeteria. Like I know that we've done some work to upgrade our cafeteria equipment, um, but there's something about, especially in high school because the DIME program, as I mentioned, does amazing work, but they're doing what, you know, they have the capacity to do. And the high school piece, I mean, kids are leaving the school buildings to go get fast food around the areas. And those lines, those lines are 40 minutes long. You know, those lines are super long and then they're missing third period. They're missing class. And I'll, I'll tell you that that's the data. Like I can tell you, I'm a parent. I'm, I talk to other parents. It is a struggle, right? And um, I, I'd love for us to be able to kind of incentivize um, just better habits, but like healthy eating habits. Um, there's also, um, I know that uh, the Durham School of Technology, um, we had some students that brought in the proposal that they had about growing food and, you know, just having community or community gardens. Um, and so that that's something else that is also part of, of, of these efforts to kind of like get kids to, you know, have buy-in in, in terms of nutrition. Um, and so I'd, I'd love to see a little bit of that. I just, I, I can almost hear Mary Oxendine's, Oxendine's presentation with the county and, you know, just talking about some of the work that the county is doing. And I'd just love for us to also just, you know, give um, give room for that in our strategic plan. Thank you. Ms. Barr. One more quick one and then I'll, I'm turning it, I'm done. I okay, think. Um, goal 5C, I think, speaks to increasing student enrollment. And I think it should be explicit by 
stating that we're planning to implement the growing together plan with fidelity or something. I mean, I, that is the, <laughs> that is amazing transformative work that we're leading. And, and I think it would be great to actually name it and, and make sure that we give it the support staff and resources that it needs to be successful. So that I just want us to hold ourselves accountable on that by naming it. Um, all right. I have, I have some feedback for y'all. <laughs> uh, thank you all so much for all the work to put this together, listening to so many different, um, ideas and thoughts around it. I have some kind of higher level thoughts and then I'll send some more specific thoughts to you all via email. I think one thing I would like to see as we start doing presentations next year about this is what have we learned from this past iteration of the strategic plan and how has that informed what we're doing moving forward? Um, because we know we have some similar priorities. We also know that COVID interrupted and, and um, to stay at home orders and virtual learning kind of interrupted a lot. But I think there was a, I know that we've learned a lot. And so I would love to know, thinking about this kind of change management and continuous improvement that we're doing as we do our presentations, this is what we learned and this is what we're doing differently because of that. I think that would be helpful too for our, us in our community to understand how DPS is thinking about change and how we're learning from what we do. I also think there's an opportunity as I was listening to my colleagues and I, even as I read this, there's the goal, there's your strategy and then you have like every department having their plan. And I think we could make a ton of goals or we could also get really specific in some of our strategies. And I think there's an opportunity in some of the strategies to get a little more specific to like around targeted for subgroups. And some of that might not be ready yet, right? It's like, okay, we know we need to do this. What are the programs or the plans that we might need to implement and bring back? But I think that might help us in order to reach the goal, we're gonna have to do some really targeted um, interventions and supports with subgroups. So how do we get really explicit about that and some of the strategies? And I think also some of the strategies could use some more, I don't know if it's like action oriented language is what I'm thinking about. So for an example, priority one, fostering academic excellence. Um, strat their strategies are not numbered, but I numbered them. So strategy for career and college readiness, it currently reads expand access to advanced courses, including blah, 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 goes on to talk about those different courses. But I really want us to see us increase enrollment and completion in those courses. And that difference, um, having access and it being in your building, but you not being in the class, right? Like we know that there are multiple schools that happen inside of one school building. And to me, that's another one that gets into this. If our goal is about increasing enrollment and completion, we know we need to have more black and brown students in those classes. And so that kind of helps hold us accountable um, versus saying, well, we added additional classes here. And that uh, to me, enrollment and completion really holds us accountable to that. So I think there's a couple more and I wrote some notes down, I'll send them to you where there's opportunities where we can shift that language a little bit that kind of puts us in an action oriented position. Uh, doo -doo -doo. I agree that we can do more around mental health and priority too, and be really specific. A lot of the things that you all said around the student survey, like how do we get data from the survey that helps inform, I think is gonna be really important. Um, and again, this goal one around increasing opportunity for access to advanced academics as well as career and technical education, I think keeps kids in class that helps reduce suspension. And so if we get more specific on those strategies. I think we can see that reducing suspension happening. And I wanna see, it's like how are we increasing students time engaged in learning? is another way to have that same conversation. If I'm engaged in learning, I'm in the right career pathway. If I'm leaving middle school in a CTE pathway that's gonna keep me connected to my, my goals in high school, like we'll see more students engaged in learning. Um, under 2B, the suspension goal talks about, the way it's written, it says DPS will reduce the percentage of the students suspended from each school to 5% or lower but the benchmark is for the whole district. So that just might need some rewording. I think we need to be 
focus on each. We know we will focus on each school too, but that might just need a, a rewording to make sure we cover that. Um, and I also thought about our school leaders who aren't mentioned explicit, explicitly here, but we know that when we think about retention, school climate, school culture, and leadership are some of the reasons why uh, people stay or people go. And so how do we, whether it's creating really explicit strategies or creating a goal around improving school culture and climate and making sure, I mean, we know our students have been through a lot. We know our educators have been through a lot, but our principals have been holding us down. <laughs> like they have been doing above and beyond for the past couple of years. So what does it mean to care for them and also support them as they're leading their school districts? I think, um, I mean, they are also holding everything in their school building every single day. So that's another, I think that's a really important retention strategy. And we didn't, we're just not as explicit in naming that. Um, and I, I, for four and five, I think it's really important that our goals are smart, they're attainable, and there's some under both of those priorities that I think could use some refining. Uh, so for example, for A, like how do we explain kind of what that looks like and what that means? I have ideas, right? I think there's ways of systems of communication that the district communicates, departments communicate, and schools communicate that focus on language justice too. So what's the kind of system that everyone follows that will help us increase communication to families, make sure it's translated in languages, and everyone kind of knows what the procedure might be. So that's a strategy, more of a goal. But I think the way the goals were in might need to be provide a little more clarity for people who are reading in the public. Blah, blah. Sorry, I feel like I'm rambling. Um, and then for 5A, why well, I want every one of our buildings to be healthy and safe and technologically current and environmentally conscious, I worry if that's an attainable goal for us. I almost hate to say that on the mic, but I, we know that finances is a very real concern. And if we want every one of our buildings to be there, we have to raise, um, we got to do a lot of bonds to, to get to that point. And so I know that we know we have a goal of wanting to do a bond in 2026, but do we need to think about that goal a little differently? Is it all schools have a plan or all buildings have a plan to move towards that? And each building is prioritizing what the goals need to be to get us closer. Um, you know, I just want to be realistic. In collaboration <laughs> with local and state leaders yes. I mean, you know or wherever the money's coming from <laughs> right wherever in our pocketbook is coming from but I just want to be realistic about in order for us to get there I think almost all of our buildings would need a, some really big rehab and so want to make clear about that so those are some of the just the little pieces that I kind of bigger picture thought about but I'll, I'll send y'all more detailed list and for us as board members too, I understand our tension of like, ooh, I want, cause I'm like, what is each department gonna do? Like how is equity focused into this? And how is that? We gotta keep it at a higher level. But I think through the updates, I hope that we get to see really specific strategies targeting a lot of the subgroups and the little pieces that we've mentioned today. That's exactly what I was gonna say. <laughs> as I listened to everybody, 3000 level, these goals are 3000 level, right? And I just want to compliment you all on the strategies that are here, because when I look at these strategies, they are detailed. They get to what the work looks like and how you get to the work. So even some of my comments that I made, I know they they sit in those strategies other than a restorative practice. I still like to see that as a goal. So it's not started from scratch. I think it's for us, again, realizing this is 3000 level and that you all do such a good job within the strategies that's listed. That's it. Cheer. Yeah, Ms. Valladar. I have a question about participation um and i know that um because uh one of my colleagues mentioned pre-k and an expansion of pre-k and in the last strategic plan there was there were some conversations but it didn't seem like it was in the last featured as much as the last strategic plan, strategic plan um and in this one i do see that it's it's a strategy right so um, we have early childhood improved pre-k to kindergarten curriculum alignment and increase enrollment in district affiliated high quality pre-k seats but i'm wondering like how robust was the conversation around pre-K in the actual strategic plan sessions? The, the, what are the reasons, one of the considerations is how our funding is allocated. So we are allocated K-12 
And so really wanting to make sure that the strategic plan that the board adopts um, is in the purview of how you are funded. We do have an excellent partnership with the governance committee and really making sure that um, we work together to make sure as part of the Durham community that there's more access for our earliest learners and making sure that our Durham pre-K um, classrooms meet that standard, are high quality. We work very closely with operations. And so the more we can have more seats where we are using some of our federal dollars and other funding, that helps the community at large because then ultimately there's more access for four-year-olds across the county. I think we know that there's um, joint excitement from each of our other bodies around universal pre-K. I think the question is continued to be, how do we fund it? How do we make sure people know how to get access to it? And um, it's, it's, it is accessible to all of our families. And I think, you know, there's a, we passed a resolution around wanting to have universal pre-K. It's like, how do we make sure we fund it, get the space for it? I'm excited that most of our new our elementary schools now will have two classrooms for pre-K. That's another step that we're making towards that commitment. But yeah, we're we're it's incremental, but we're making some progress there. I I 100% understand the concern about funding. Like I've been here long enough that I know it's not in our funding dollars, and I also know it is almost the most effective evidence-based like early intervention that we can do that will help all the way through our K-12, right? I mean, so that's known. And if we're going to push, I mean, we have funding mechanisms for the county to share funding for us explicitly for pre-K that, that is targeted for that. They're committed to increasing that. I just want us to actually, they're not going to do that without us reminding, I mean, because we're the school board and and the, our focus is education, it's going to live with us to be lead advocates for it. And so that's why I still kind of want us to consider being as explicit as we can in a stated goal rather than strategy. Um, and if I can't prevail this time, I'll just keep being annoying about it for a while, but I don't want to do that. I mean, I want us to, like, we believe in it, right? I mean, our, our kindergarten teachers believe in it. Our early childhood folks that are teaching three-year-olds because they qualify through child find believe in it. So um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's so sound. I just want us to lead the advocacy. Chair, I'm said we, we appreciate the feedback and I, you know, upon your direction, welcome even more feedback via email. Um, we yield to the board in terms of um, what the readiness is and the expectation is in terms of um, next steps, um, in terms of incorporating the feedback and then um, how the board would like to move forward. We, we gave y'all a lot of feedback. So um, thank you for listening. I, I got one more thing though. I, um, I, as I was looking through all these strategies and if I was a teacher, I might feel that we're gonna ask them to do a lot of things. And how do we actually put a goal around care and joy for our staff? I actually think is really important. Um, yeah, like we need, people need to feel cared for and supported and joy in their workplace. And I think by putting it in the strategic plan, it holds us accountable for that in our school buildings. And we know that it's an it's another retention tool. I love that one. Thank that's, you. that's awesome, yeah. Yeah, I just want to thank you all for the feedback. I know that my kids have been taking a lot of notes. <laughs> huh? He's going to use his wisdom and experience from other places to be able to craft um, something that uh, will be able to react to it before we bring it to you. But uh, I'll say this. Uh, I appreciate your feedback. Um, we really want to see our district really moving forward. That's pretty much the goal of all of us. But as we're working in this society, we have some obstacles um, that is pretty much beyond our control, especially anything that we're going to do, aspiration goals, smart goals, funding got to be a part of that as well. Um, those of us that's where the job fair, um, if I can say this in a political correct way, uh, the pool is really shallow. Um, when you go to all this school of education, the pool is not there. 
with that, when I look at our goal, for example, where we are with our black uh, teachers, educators, about 39%. I don't want to brag about it. We don't really work compared to other places. If we have to go to all these local universities, even across the state, I don't see a lot of black males there. Okay. We put in these goals. I know we have to report to you all whether or not we're making progress, whether or not it's uh, green, yellow, or red. That's where I really wanted us to be smart goals and be realistic as well. We're going to work really hard. Uh, Paul is looking at me. We'll be looking at our finance uh, to see how we have to add some of those positions to make sure that we're getting the job done as well. Um, we go to our county to make sure that we get resources uh, for all these reoccurring positions. But anytime we have to add position on our own, we have to make sure that we maintain those as well. Those are the struggle that we know as we're gonna implement this uh, particular uh, strategic plan. We really wanna make sure that finance is there to be able to address the needs. Even if we have to come up with an easy goal, we're gonna do everything possible, but the pool is not there. I just really wanted to bring all these obstacles as we put in this aspiration of uh, strategic plan in place. There are a lot of work that's going to be done and we're gonna do everything possible, even adding position to make sure that so we're meeting the needs of our students. But I really wanted to be honest enough to say, it's getting harder. Not only for our educators and not only for our teachers, for our principals and central office as well. Uh, I just really wanted us to be realistic, but the work, it's a lot of work. That's gonna take a lot of finance for us to be able to climb all these mountains. Uh, your feedback's well, well taken. And uh, I heard you loud and clear when it comes to our students of color. We're gonna make sure if we're gonna go to A, B, C, F, we're gonna do that. Those are really things that can be done but I just wanted to reiterate the fact that uh, there are a lot of work that's going to be done there that we're gonna need really funds to make it happen. That's important to, to note, Dr. Mavinga. Um, and I hope we continue to also just, and I know we do think creatively about the gyms that we currently have in DPS and how do we help use those folks to help move us in different positions. And I also think about, um, for us board, you know, we asked a lot about some of the subgroup specificity and goals, but some of that also is our work as we get our presentations, we will get a lot of this disaggregated data. Um, and how do we keep holding our administration responsible and asking those really good questions around how do we move each subgroup um, forward? And I know our board is committed to that. We all have a focus on equity and thinking about racial equity and many of our students who've experienced mar marginalization is important to us. So I hope that we continue to keep that in the forefront as we get all these different presentations. I was mm -hmm. wondering is, as a next step, would it be that at the work session, you all come with some revision and it with, with data points that you think are reasonable stretch goal. I mean, you know, not smart goals, not overextended, but also if we ask something and, and you can't do it, or you think it's a stupid idea, I'm okay hearing that. Like, like I just, I think that's super important for y'all to be able to, to push back and wrestle with us about, you know, what is realistic? What is, what is, too far of a stretch, you know, and, and would that be a fair next step in at our work session, something like that? Can I hope if it's okay with you all board work with Dr. Hardy and Dr. Mabinga to figure out how we, we gave a lot of notes. And so I want to make sure that they have the time they need to come kind of sort and discuss and have those conversations so that we can bring it back to a meeting. Um, we had before this one, we had some two by twos to review this and it might be another opportunity to do some of that to share Yes, no, maybe so. This is what we did. Um, and so that we can have that information. But I'll work with you all to make sure. I just want to be respectful of this time of the year. And I know we gave copious notes. So I appreciate that. Thank you all. That is the end of our agenda for this evening. I'll take a motion, or excuse me, the end of that portion of the agenda for the evening. I'll take a motion to go into closed session. Move that we go into closed session for the reasons stated on the agenda. Second. 
It's been moved by Ms. Byer, seconded by Ms. Chavez. Any other discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, please use the same sign. Passes unanimously. We are now in closed session.
We're back in open session. Dr. Mabinga. Madam Chair, I'm here to seek your approval for the personnel report as discussed at the closed session. Move approval of personal report dated April 20th, 2023, as presented in the closed session. Second. It's been moved by Ms. Lewis, seconded by Ms. Chavez. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, please use the same sign. Passes unanimously. I'd also like to move that we table the property acquisition. All right. Second. It's been moved by Ms. Lewis, seconded by Ms. Byer. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, please use the same sign. And with that, we are adjourned. Everyone have a good evening.